الاردن قبل الديجيتال فوتوغرافي من 82 ل 2000 وقبله نيجاتيفز قصص يعني بس هلا عم برسم اكثر شيء اوكي اوكي يعني عاد قديش تطول التجربه هاي عشان تخلص <تصفيق> لا انا صراحه الكورونا ريحتني لانه كنت دائما اضطر اطلع في حجج اتفادى المجتمع وهلا اجت كورونا واعطتني الطريقه اللي بحب اعيش فيها اساسا اوكي اوكي هلا هو كثير منا هيك حابب هاي هاي الانعزال بس يكون في اتصال بس يعني زي طلابه مع ناس زيك وهيك يكون في عندنا ديالوج بلكي هاي احلى شيء بالعمليه بالزبط. الاكاديميه بالنسبه لنا والله يعني مساء الخير جميعا اه دكتوره فداء دكتورة فداء الحمد لله دكتوره فداء مهندس عمار هي رئيس قسم الانتيريور عندنا اهلا بك قسم الانتيريور كيفك بس مهندس يعطيك العافيه اهلا 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 يعني سحبناها من الجامعه الالمانيه اه <تصفيق> نحن رح نبلش كمان دقيقتين لا لا خلينا شوية هلا 67 خلينا نوصلهم شوية أعلى هو رح يوصلوا أعلى على فكرة بتوقع اليوم عدد يكون كبير يا لأنه بعت كثير لأن آه آه. تبعوني عرفت كيف حيكون أكثر من طلاب يعني مش بس مش بس طلابنا مساء الخير جميعا يعطيكم ألف عافية مساء النور اهلا وسهلا هلا 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 دكتور ياسر انا بس عملت اي شيرد معك البرزنتيشن جست ان كيس انا ات جوت ديسكونكتد من عندي اوكي اه اوكي فجاه عمال فيها جت لي مسج انه في سم سم اوف ذا اودينس وير ديسكونكتد ديو تو تكنيكال بروبلمز ما بعرف هلا والله طلع لي بيقول لي انه في ناس من اللي كانوا داخلين على بحاول نشغل الصوت اليوم مع شو اسمه؟ مع الاي تي دكتور ياسر انت هلا بتقولي عشان ثالثه ورابعه بالنسبه لممدوح بشارات الجوري؟ اه يعني هتكون سم تايم ان شاء الله نكست ويك يعني هي عشان هيك بكتب مع المهندس عمار يكون معنا ان شاء الله المهندس عمار وفي عندنا اللي هم اور بارتنرز ان بلجيكا في بلجيكا اوكي شو اخبارك؟ تمام الحمد لله اه شو وين؟ اه سيزار كيف حالك؟ شايف كانك كانك تعبان بال مع الخشب مبين كانك مش بالاردن اللي خلفك آه بالاتك والله بالاتك آه بالبيت اه ايوه عشان هيك اه شو آه. محبوب عليك من العيله؟ اه شايفها نفوني <تصفيق> لفوق اه هاي نصوص 77 انا بقول نستنى شويه 78 اوكي و... و اور 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 <تصفيق> مرحبا يا جماعة شو لسه ما بلشت؟ مين معانا؟ محمد اهلا اهلا كيف حالك يا باشمهندس؟ عمار يعطيك العافية اهلا اهلا كيف حالك؟ تمام شكرا دكتورة فداء مرحبا دكتور نايف مرحبا دكتور ياسر مرحبا دكتور سامي مرحبا سيزار مرحبا يعطيكم العافيه اهلا استاذي هلا لو ديني انت بتقول لي اسمك 
لا القريب اه ابو جديد <تصفيق> لا 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 القريب بلاش فضايع اوكي ثلاث دقائق بنبلش اوكي عشان نكون تاخرنا 10 دقائق يعني مش مشكله مش مشكله يعني عشان ما نقاطع يعني هلا صار 78 يعني على 80 دكتور نايف ايوه منين وين بتلاقي حلاقين؟ انا في بل... انا حلقت لي لين على طول عفارق ما عندي مشكلة عليك حلقت لي على طول لازم ما تحلق لك يا دكتور ما في مشكلة عندي دكتور حلقت لك بأي معنى؟ ما في زي ما بدك بأي معنى في لها معنيين ما انا قاصد يوم الاثنين وحياة الله لك كل المعاني عن صاحب عندي معاني يعني عن جهتين بحكي جد هلا طيب كلام يوصل ما في مشكلة متفجر كمان ايه رح اقول متفجر كمان يمكن هي سمعته هلا يمكن هي سمعته اوريدي اه مش عارف اذا هي معانا ولا لا اللي هنا بتحلق لي بالبيت والله بس حكيت لي عن جهتين قلت لكم بس بدي اسال دكتور الحلقه عن ناسف دكتور ولا كيف؟ كيف؟ الحلقه عن ناسف هذا <تصفيق> <تصفيق> عندك عن ناسف انا لا والله عن ناسف انا والله ما فيني انا عندي دخيلك رجعونا على ماذا بدخيلكم <تصفيق> طيب 85 86 اه والله 80 اوكي يعني جود ايفن يو ار فري ناو اف يو ونت تو ستارت اوكي سو جود ايفنينج ايفري ون I'm I'm gonna leave the introduction to Dr. Yasser Saqir, the head of the Department of Architecture, to present our guest today, Architect Ammar Khamnash. If anyone has questions, please don't hesitate to either write them in the chat during the presentation or during the question and answer to just open the mic and and ask away. Okay, Dr. Yasser, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome uh, our friends, our colleagues, our students here in the uh, American University of uh, Madaba or uh, Israel and Jordan or abroad. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, I'm honored today to uh, present, introduce to you. Uh, one of the most important architects, not only in Jordan, but in the region, in our region, uh, Ammar Khamash. Uh, Ammar is really uh, one of the people that is challenging to describe or to uh, introduce. Uh, and really requires from me an unconventional way of uh, introduction. Perhaps uh, uh, he can be best uh, described through the words of my uh, spiritual Sufi teacher in Damascus, uh, the late Bashir Bani, who used to tell me uh, in French, Dis-moi que tu fréquentes, je te dis que tu veux. In, in, uh, which in uh, English means, tell me who's your friend, I tell you who you are. In Arabic, tell me who you are, I tell you who It's best uh, to describe Ammar through the things that he spends time with, the things that he befriends, the objects of his passion, which is nature. Uh, Ammar is, among other things, he's a conservationist, 
He's an archaeologist. He's a geologist. He's a painter. And he, through all of this, he defines his architectural career. Uh, what Ammar, uh, um, following him uh, throughout you know, his career, what Ammar is uh, uh, attempting in his journey to tap, and I think his journey will continue, because it's a difficult journey, is uh, not to uh, relate to nature in the objective material materialist ma manner. Rather, that inner energy, that... Uh, um, reality that is beyond gender, beyond space, and beyond history or time. A reality that some people name God, others name nature. And it's a reality that, and this is the most difficult of all, that can only be reached, that secret can only be reached if one manages the impossible task of transcending his or her, her ego. But what is, uh, uh, Ammar is going to share with us today is attempts of this journey of trying to transcend, defy the ego to listen to nature. In such a way, he establishes an identity with whereby nature will tell him what it wants to be done. Thus is the title of his talk, Nature as, an, as the Architect. I introduce to you, Ammar. Thank you. Um, well, I'm uh, very happy to be able to uh, be with all of you, and uh, I thank you, and I thank uh, uh, Claudine uh, for inviting me. Um, let, let's start. Uh, we'll be going through a lot of images, and I'll be talking about them and, you know, why I put them together and why they may uh, explain the what made me uh, think the way I do and... Uh, you know, my background, my mental um, composition, if you will, to the day uh, that we are in. Um, I'm, uh, I found myself born in, in this landscape, um, which now we call Jordan, and, uh, and I wanted to know what is inside, what is hidden in this landscape? What, what makes it look the way it does look? Why is it like this? So um, I even in, in from the times uh, before studying i studied in uh, louisiana lafayette louisiana in the us architecture but even before going there i was already a landscape uh, painter and uh, already obsessed with understanding this um, um, this object you know it's it's just for me it became, it's a time life uh, obsession of understanding everything. So here we have, for example, the Eastern Desert and uh, for the way I wanted to understand how Jordan came to be, what shapes this landscape from the very, very early time. So we look at the East Mediterranean. Next slide, please. Um, our location uh, in this amazing hinge which is, I call it a hinge, it's sometimes called in um, anthropology and other sciences, uh, Levantine Bridge out of Africa. So it is really an amazing connection uh, of so many important chunks of, of continents. And we are so lucky to be at this corridor uh, that, you know, uh, that is, makes it much richer and complex. Uh, next slide, please. So even uh, looking at Google images, I take notes and I go and drive 
two locations where I have certain questions uh, so to understand. And, uh, and here you see a lot of things uh, that like direction of wind, uh, fault lines, and um, how the entire uh, piece of rock that is now called Jordan has been shaped and what is happening to it and why it looks the way it does. Next, please. So um, this entire landscape I've actually visited um, by car and on foot. And I made sure that I understand not just the surface, but what is underground, you know, faults and, uh, you know, movements and earthquakes and hydrology and geological, uh, geological pillars and um, different m minerals. And uh, next, please. So we see here, for example, you know, a slide like this one, and we see a line. I don't know, do you see the mouse moving? Anyway. Uh, uh, yes, but they can only see my, my screen. Yeah, do you see my, my, the mouse are moving? You don't see, no? Okay. no. Yes, no we, see, yeah, we, we see. see it. We see my we mouse. See. <laughs> no, my mouse. Ah. No, no, okay, yeah. anyway. No, anyway, I mean, this, uh, you know, uh, it's, there are certain um, faults that I was really interested that start from Jordan and they go way into Saudi Arabia. One of them is called Al Fayha fault, which starts from Al Karak and goes all the way to Najd. Um, and uh, it, for me, this is very important to understand what happens and how humans reacted to these uh, geological features that are hidden and some people don't even, even look at them, but um, I see them as a master planning uh, force and in, that lead, you know, all kinds of infrastructure and even settlement, uh, etc. Uh, next, please. And this is the close up of the fault. As you can see, uh, it's a diagonal, this central, yeah, like going at 45 degree. This is just to the uh, uh, east southeast of Karak immediately. Um, and as you can see, the fault, which is like a crack, let's say in the bedrock, has actually guided the road. So there's like a farming uh, um, street or road that follows the fault. And again, this fault goes all the way to Saudi Arabia, way into, uh, um, into the Al Ula area and then further uh, south um, east. Yeah, next please. So again, I'm, I, uh, when I finished architecture in the US, I went to, uh, a, to the AA in, in London, Architecture Association, and I stayed only for two months uh, for higher education. Uh, didn't like at all what, what they were presenting, and I then went back and to Yarmouk University to study anthropology and archaeology, a mixture um, called ethnoarchaeology which is like archaeology and anthropology together. And that was very, very important because it gave me tools that architectural education doesn't give. Um, so I could actually look at from, I could use um, um, archaeology and anthropology uh, to understand design decision from the past. Because archaeology is the opposite of, um, of architecture. In fact, in archaeology, we we have reality and then we excavate and we make drawings. In architecture, we make drawings and then we turn them into reality. So it's the, it's the upside down, uh, it's the exact opposite. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay. Can you see the slide? Or? I can't see it, but uh, it doesn't matter. I can see it on the side. Uh, it doesn't matter. Okay. So uh, again, uh, I'm looking. At, I'm looking at. I'm looking at all kind of things like patterns. How nature makes a pattern, and and how and why a pattern like this looks like, you know, in, in, uh, brain cells or like in, in neurology or like veins, blood vessels in the brain. Here I am also interested in, in the whole geological column of Jordan. Um, 
I have now memorized the entire um, layered geological pillar, which goes back to 500 million years, and I could actually travel in Jordan everywhere, anywhere, and I know where I am on that geological pillar, uh, which gives me a vision almost like a doctor looking through a body, like an X-ray vision. So if I'm driving from Amman to Aqaba, I know exactly where I am at every stage, and I know where a layer ended, another one starts, and I know their 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 content and their their fossils or you know uh, paleontology or paleobotany and etc. Now, from from sites, I I look at also at early settlements like here in the east of uh, uh, Azraq, where you have beautiful small volcanoes settled by uh, prehistoric settlements, uh, you know, 14,000 years ago to uh, 5,000 years ago. And, um, and they've started, this is the very early birth of architecture. I mean, Jordan has, sits in, on the library of the invention of architecture, where humans started, decided actually to settle and, and invent what we now call architecture. It, it kind of happened mostly between Jordan and Eastern Turkey, Anatolia, and of course, Syria, and this fertile crescent, if you will. And the Eastern desert is very, very, very important for architects uh, if they're interested in the birth, in the day that architecture was born. So I'm interested in, in these rather, instead of stylistic in architecture history, Baroque and all this Rococo or classical period, I'm interested in the early, you know, in, because the very early looks very modern to me and uh, it's so abstract, it's so minimalist and I can really learn from them how a nature gave them uh, design ideas and I don't have to copy them, but I could, if I understand them well, it will be stored in my subconscious when I design. And these slides actually show, this is an important slide. If you look at the upper side, you have one of those kites, which is like a hunting apparatus in the upper middle slide. And it's like a V shape ending with a, a almost like a flower shape. And uh, that entire thing is, is unbelievably beautiful. And uh, exactly, this is the one. And interesting that if you look at it, it looks a bit like uh, how sp what spiders do. Uh, next, please. And other, another one here, if you look in the middle, they actually use the, the, the erosion and they build on the edge of the erosion another kite uh, that is... Give the yeah. I don't need to listen. Next, please. Yeah, next, please. And here, like the one with the mark you could see, and there's another one. I mean, this is... A, <clears throat> Let's go through them. <clears throat> Next, please. <clears throat> For me, those those are the same thing like here, where you have a spider <clears throat> using an existing thorn or a, <clears throat> a shrub and knitting on it. I mean, <clears throat> the idea of, of using an existing situation is very, very important, where the landscape becomes the designer, the the site becomes the architect. And here, this is what the spider have done. And I compare this in scale. You know, when you get, you start to think about <clears throat> methodology or an idea, then the scale doesn't matter. I mean, here, this is a spider doing something that is only three or four centimeter. And I look at it in the same way how uh, some humans in Jordan 8,000 years ago did some some trap uh, that is eight kilometers across and the same way using, you know, using the landscape, uh, the same way like the spider is using the thorns. Next, please. And this is how we know that what they are, because we found, the archaeologists have found many drawings uh, on the Safayitic inscriptions in the area of northeastern Jordan, the basalt area, Al-Harra al, al urduniya and uh, some of these drawings actually show, um, you know, the how how they function. You know how the people are pushing the gazelle 
basically uh, in, into these traps. Next, please. Next slide. Next slide. This is, um, just to give you a scale, this is uh, Northern Azraq, Al Azraq al Shamali, or Al Azraq Al Druze, it's often called. And you can see the roads, you can see the town, and you can see the kite. One kite is in the uh, upper, exactly, left corner. This is the kite. And as you can see how the urban, or the, the, the village or the town is growing and erasing it. But I just want to show you the scale of it. And some of the arms of this can go up to uh, two or three kilometer. Um, um, and they are always facing east. And it obviously have to do with the seasonal migration of uh, gazelle uh, running across the desert. And uh, this is how they were catching them. Next, please. Next, please. Again, I'm, I'm interested in, in how um, nature makes form. Uh, the, the entire idea of massing or morphology and um, as a result of movement of moisture and differential erosion. Um, this is a, 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 a small monument uh, called the Raha. It's uh, to the uh, north uh, east or east of uh, Ma'an northeast of Man, actually. Um, but I'm really interested in what's happening in the neck of it, because it's that's a layer that is very important in geology. It's uh, the time of the extinction of the dinosaur uh, 40, uh, 64 million years ago. So I go there and I have the studies and plans with me or maps done by the natural, Jordan Natural Authority, Natural Resource Authority, and I read all the technical reports and I go there and I actually understand what's happening uh, on the ground. Next, please. And this desert, which is uh, covering about uh, maybe more than 50% of Jordan, is covered with this flint uh, layer. Next, please. Which has a lot of um, fossil trace fossils, like here, these are burrows. They are like marks of uh, shrimp-like animal uh, that um, have been preserved in in this layer of uh, uh, geological sedimentation rock, uh, basically flint. Um, and you can see all the traffic and how they've actually uh, recorded their movement uh, in this layer. Next, please. And I'm also interested in the behavior of these rocks, how they, uh, how they break um, and shatter because of uh, erosion and different temperature and also microfossils in them that expand and make, make them pop. But how, but how they make patterns, you know, I'm really interested in how nature... <laughs> yeah. uh, next, please. Also, the, these very rocks, I'm um, also interested in the early humans uh, that started actually you, one of the very first uh, sharp, before uh, the invention of metallurgy and metals, which also happened uh, in this part of the world, one of the earliest, about 7,000 uh, years ago. Humans um, use these rocks because they actually can give them an amazing sharp edge. Uh, so how how can we make as designers, how can we make added value? We have a natural material and we give it an added value. This is what architecture is all about. It's giving added value to a place and material and a space. But you have to understand simply the older process. You know, these implements are an amazing invention. And when they were done, they were like an extension of our teeth and our hands and it's without them they wouldn't have made architecture so we have i have to understand the 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 uh i have to see the entire movie from the first scene you know i cannot just uh start uh, with, with architecture next please next please and then from from hundreds of trips in the desert i discovered or i noticed that these stones actually are ringing and making sounds under the wheels of the car or where i'm walking on that carpet what we call in the desert the entire phenomenon is called is called um, desert pavement 
the the desert, the environment of the desert does like a pavement. It looks like a, a man-made or human-made pavement of same size rocks. And then I start using uh, my iPhone to listen to them because you have to know that you are hundreds of times more equipped than, than, than your father or your grandfather. Everybody with a smartphone in, in their pocket with a couple of apps has an entire lab in their pocket. And uh, so I start to listen with uh, simple apps, starting with the guitar tuning apps to uh, identify different notes and listening which note do they fit. And then other apps that actually Oxford Wave Analyzer, which actually give you different different waves. And a lot of these stones have uh, many, many um, notes in them, which we call polyphonic. And sometimes there are up to 12 notes together with some one or two predominant notes. So they're often like every, every stone alone is like, an, is like an, a musical instrument. And or every one of them is actually like a chord, you know. Um, this is a, a project that I did uh, based on the chromatic scale of the normal typical piano. Uh, so we could actually find uh, easily uh, enough stones to construct exactly the the notes that are now played on a typical piano. Next, please. And here you can see the their, how they fit. And of course, they are those are purely natural. I if any one of them breaks, I take it out of my research because I want to make sure that I'm only using what nature has produced, uh, whether by chance or whether by coincident or or is there any hidden order uh, within these millions of stones? Do they have any scale? Next, please. Next, please. So here I start to go uh, into you know uh, Fibonacci and uh, mathematics and um, the golden rules and and then challenging the entire uh, situation we have right now of this international music that is now falling into one mold that we call chromatic scale, which is you know the black and white keys of any piano. And I start to do non-chromatic and uh, um, and it's not micro, it's not typical microtonal. And listen here, I don't want to get too technical because this gets very um, difficult for non-musicians or those who are even for musicians because this is more from music theory, uh, not just musicians who perform. But here I'm constructing different uh, mathematics of different uh, scales that um, are completely against or unlike any uh, piano and uh, musicians don't like them at all because they cannot play them. Um, it's like suddenly you take all the alphabets of English out and you put some other symbols and then writers cannot write anymore. Next, please. And also experimentation of changing material. The upper three uh, flint stones are from the Jordan Desert and they're copied below in, the, in, 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 um, in aluminum. And then we copied again in, uh, in um, bronze the idea is to separate the form from the material. So we, we, we freeze the form and we change the material. And then we listen to them again. And then here we discovered, I discovered in that experiment, is that the, the, the melody remains the same, but it moves down together, which in music we call, we call transpose. This is a, a sample of a wave. Um, a C, it's called rip, ripple marks in geology, it's um, a sea, a shallow sea with a moving uh, water. And uh, this is like 450 million year old. Um, it, and we have beautiful exposure and you can see the direction of the water um, that is coming or storm that is coming from the upper uh, left to the lower right. Uh, and again, I'm also interested uh, in structure. Here we have a, a fossilized waterfall. It's actually a double arch. Uh, it's it's kind of near Deir Allah. It's uh, east of uh, Deir Allah in the Zarqa River Wadi. And uh, the scale is fantastic. You know, the upper, the, the bigger arch below the double arch, the bigger arch in the middle is about four or five meter high. And uh, the entire arch is made of conglomerate. Conglomerate is like a, is like how nature makes concrete. It's like a lot of bunch of broken uh, pebbles that are 
you know stuck together uh, by a matrix uh, line. So um, so this is uh, yeah. Again, I'm uh, I'm interested in in patterns and process. If we look at the other slide, next one, please. What happens? How how surfaces are designed? How nature give us surfaces? Can we not copy? I don't want to do a mold of this. I want to understand the process and maybe create a process. Uh, doesn't have to be three D printers. It could be some. Um, you know, a special mixture, it could be a special um, fabric that I put and, and make make it behave different with moisture and attract, let's say, uh, you know, another material. So I'm interested in processes. And, uh, and here, example is of a staircase. This is in, the, in Wild Jordan. And um, for me, this looks like a fossil. It is like a trace fossil. In fact, all architectures trace fossil, you know, when we disappear after a thousand years, people look at our houses and they could figure out the, the, what kind of animal was living in these houses. And uh, for me, I'm interested in the, in, 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 in the process of how things are made, not the final product. And uh, in fact, this was never designed to look like that. Uh, the were Egyptian workers here, I remember very well, um, removed the shuttering and then they started the uh, plastering and i said and then i told them no no this is why do you plaster it's so beautiful because it shows all your decisions and that is a trace fossil so it's a time fossil that shows what happened the process next please again i don't uh, understand how we can teach architecture if architects don't understand the very basic um, 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 subjects in geology, because geology is the main warehouse, not just in Jordan, but especially in Jordan, but everywhere else. That is, it's a main main warehouse of materials. You know, this is basalt in Wadi Al Hidan. We have to understand the very basic. I don't think that arch architects should, you know, have a PhD in geology, but they should understand the difference, the very basic difference between. Uh, for example, igneous rocks and sedimentary rocks, and the very basic. I mean, you cannot you cannot build with stone or concrete or or glass or steel without understanding how they are found in nature. You know, if you take any design that you do in Amman or in in Jordan, it's like ninety percent, even the wood, which is not directly geology, but wood grows on certain layers and in certain soil and. So basically, geology is the mother that, um, that architecture is born. Next, please. Next, please. And also, I'm interested in color and how geology colors and the process of color. You know, can we make a building that has a coloring, a self-coloring mechanism? Can we make a building that has minor cracks that have minerals and the building is changing color in 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 couple of years and we, i've done a bit of that of you know putting like copper in in concrete and uh, copper powder and and see what happens and make it um you know um generative design but not with a computer i mean uh, next please this is for example um an area below Petra where you start to have the uh, copper um, um, brought by water into the into the folds of the rock and coloring the rock. Next, please. Or you know volcanic uh, shafts that push within uh, sandstone layers. Next, please. And the structural and how how geology makes cantilevers and how geology. Uh, you know, decides to to make cavities and the process. And you can see the scale. There's a person standing uh, in the middle, uh, lower third middle of the slide, exactly. You can see the scale. And this is, if you look on the horizon, that is the uh, university on the way to uh, Salt. Uh, it's called uh, Amman. Uh, it's Saru area. What's the university there? Amman. 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 
الاهليه this is الاهليه actually so this is a hidden wadi there is amazing it's called wadi al-hur wadi al-hur um it's just to the west of uh, ain basha um next please next please this is a layer uh, that is very important it's from what it's actually from dead sea and it's called lisan formation because it's from the lisan lake and it shows all the um, summers and winters and it's almost um, a record of uh, the different weather when we had good rain and bad rain and good years and bad years the, all the black lines or brown dark brown lines are winter and this and the white are summer and you can see sometimes we had more um, earthquakes or choppy, uh, you know, where we have the uh, zigzag shapes. Um, it's a very, very important layer because it is well studied now and compared with other layers in the world uh, about whether, um, you know, paleo, paleo climate, or ancient climate cycles. Next, please. Next, please. Now, with, for me, uh, if I wasn't an architect, I would have liked to be a botanist, a, a plant uh, scientist, because plants are unbelievable. They are, uh, uh, there are so much uh, to do with architecture because they are rooted in a location. If you want to be uh, an architect, you should be, learn more about botany. And if you want to be a designer of uh, airplanes and cars, and then you go zoology because they are moving, you know, like birds and fish. So for an architect, uh, plants are uh, very, very important. Uh, next, please. And especially how they choose a site and how they evolve and how they make structure and how they make all the tasks that a building should be making, which is uh, making a shelter, collecting energy. And uh, next, please. Next, please. So in, in botany, I'm interested also in the entire issue of biomimicry and uh, in the use of color for energy and for photosynthesis and for um, spreading the kind uh, through uh, attract, attracting insects, etc. Next, please. And Jordan is, is, you know, it's one of the most exciting places because we have so many different ecosystems, which means that you could drive within, within 20 minutes and change uh, the entire habitat from Mediterranean to Sudan-Mediterranean African ecosystem. And then, uh, and then you drive another half an hour and you're in a Sahara Arabian desert environment uh, or desert ecosystem. Next, please. So I'm interested also in the behavior of the architecture of desert plants, how desert plants harvest moisture and how they make a strategy to survive. You don't want to, you know, these strategies are not, non, kind of non-existence in, in the Amazon forest because they have another struggle there, which is reaching light, finding enough light. But with water, you don't want to go to the Amazon to study about how the intelligent ways of plants to find water and uh, collect water but in the desert you have the most amazing uh, examples and uh, often they are uh, an architectural solution like in this case you know shading and capping the soil below the plant next please and here is one of the strangest plants uh, ever uh, this is the only scientific paper that I've written uh, published with peer reviewers is not about about architecture it's about this plant it's called the plant is called uh, rium palestinum and it actually does uh, a very very strange harv collection of moisture it's like a moisture trap it actually tr uh, con condensates sub under the leaf it condensates um, um, ra rising uh, vapor uh, of water and um, uh, f from the ground and then it, it allows itself uh, 14 times more water than the average. Next, please. Because in the desert, it doesn't make sense to have a big uh, leaf, but this, this plant does the exact 
un, uh, you know, unexplainable. It just makes a huge size leaf in the middle of the desert up to 60 centimeters. This is the title of the paper for somebody who wants to read it. Um, because here I used 3D modeling and, uh, you know, all kinds of architectural analysis for botany to use it in, in, in explaining botanical behavior. And that behavior is, uh, has been the first time identified is actually new to science as a behavior in plants. Um, and then I discovered many other plants do the same, uh, like this one as well. And again, um, um, we've actually started printing some of them in uh, the, the, uh, the, the other, the big leaf. We start printing 3D printers into a, like a plastic leaf, uh, you know, big leaf. And we try to see if does it do harvest, how morphology can make the harvest in the desert. Can we copy the form and would the form still function? to harvest uh, and then and then if this works then we can make a bigger building that does harvesting of moisture next please now of course we have petra which is um, a fantastic university petra what we normally see is maybe five percent when you go and see the treasury this is like five percent um the rest of it is you have to go there days and days and days. I think I've seen maybe 30%. And uh, I've been in Petra for like 20 times in the last uh, five years. And each time I go like stay for five days and, and it's impossible to finish. But the Nabataeans are unbelievable. And here you can see this fantastic uh, way that where architecture is just enough, it's just it's not overdoing. They just did the staircase, and when the slope is not needed anymore, they stopped. And the whole idea of of um, symbiotic relationship and uh, and trying to really negotiate in a very shy way and a smart way with nature instead of overpowering it uh, the way we do right now. Next, please. And. Of course, there are a lot of beautiful stories here. Um, this is this slide is a lecture by itself. You know, all the black lines show divisions that were built in the 70s and they're removed. And um, every time I go there, uh, uh, I explain to people uh, what happened because even the plumber pipes of the 70s and 80s are becoming like Jordanian layer, if you will, in this uh, Nabataean uh, first century. Uh, BC structure. Next, please. And also, I'm interested in, in, in finishes and uh, how, you know, how plaster is made, fingerprints. Um, and I'd like to actually see if some students are interested to uh, go there with some, you know, microscopes handheld and look or may take like, you know, macro images and look at fingerprints in this uh, water system in Petra. Uh, this is on the way to the airport. It's actually a slide. Uh, you can see the shiny line. Uh, and I've seen a uh, couple of uh, times kids are actually using and it. It might be very ancient, but it's still used today. And uh, very few people know about it. It's uh, not far from the, uh, let's say, Bisharat uh, club on the way to the airport. Next. Again, the Nabataeans are amazing what they've done with the pottery. The pottery is, uh, can go as thin as one millimeter. This is a part of a plate that is about 20 centimeter. And you can see uh, that technology, which is so strange and nobody knows uh, exactly how they could do it. Next, please. But also in archaeology, what is exciting is what remains from extraction. This is a quarry, most likely Roman. The Roman period was the most amount of quarrying in Jordan. Um, so, and you can see the, the morphology, you know, the, yes, yes. You it yourself. Yes. Nice. Yeah. 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 Next please. So what happens when in architecture, because in architecture, we normally add, but what happens when you have architecture that is a result of subtraction, the opposite, this is like what Petra is all about making in the minus you know it's subtracting and the result of the subtraction is so exciting in terms of morphology uh so i'm again interested in how nature makes form but also how human interaction with nature make form 
this is a site that is very very important uh i unfortunately the government doesn't the government government doesn't take it seriously for me it's more important than jarash it's halfway between amman and uh, zarqa and it's a quarry of the roman columns and here you have the roman columns uh, some of the roman columns that are still stuck they're still uh, attached to the bedrock uh, because the entire that order was cancelled so the columns are there carved three quarter of them and the lower part is still part of the bedrock this place called abu sayyah and it's a, it's a huge quarry uh, uh, of many many pillars and uh, in many stages of the carving and they're still stuck in the uh, and for me it's much more important jarash is kind of boring we have 20 30 places like jarash at least in in uh, turkey it's a copy of any roman city here is a process this is a site that will teach everybody how the romans uh, extracted columns and this is architecture um, it's not the decoration it's not here you see examples of columns that were marked maybe by contractor or some ownership and they and the and they started with the grass they started the carving and then the order was cancelled so the column was never extracted completely this is the very early thing they do the marking you know on the bedrock where a column um, of a certain dimension that somebody in amman in or the uh, citadel uh, an architect is ordering five columns eight meter long and this is where they start marking them uh, at the early stages next I try to convince the, the mayor and the minister of tourism and uh, anyway, forget it. Next. And here you see how the columns are shaped in, uh, are carved in different stages. And the left, tri left side is kept rough because they have to uh, push the column uh, about, you know, 15 kilometer to Amman or to the construction site. And they push them on that rough side and then in in uh, the city or on the site of construction, they continue carving the rest uh, of the sites. This uh, piece was broken, so it was you know left. Uh, and here, if you see in the lower part, in the lower middle, uh, lower uh, third middle image, lower third, exactly. No, on the left a little bit. This is a rope mark. You can see how the ropes. Now we have the dimension of the ropes. It's like trace fossils. We can actually go there, and not just the dimension. We can look with microscopes or a magnifying glass and see the, the, the pulling direction because it will do what we call striation or lineation, which are like parallel you know, um, uh, stripes. And we can know now the Roman rope here, the, the uh, size of the Roman rope and how much load uh, on it from that quarry. This is a burial, uh, small burial chamber. What is exciting about it, this is probably, uh, Hellenistic, I would say, maybe two centuries, you know, 200 BC. But important uh, is the drainage above the square. You have the beautiful uh, drainage for the rock up, 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 above, above, above. Yeah, that line. There's a, there's a line. Yeah, that line at an angle is actually to make sure that the rain, not too much rain, is going inside. So um, for me, it's. It's so important how to actually learn how they took decisions and how less they can do, the less they did with the maximum gained. Uh, of course, a lot of finger marks. This is Islamic Qasr uh, Tuba, and you can put your fingers in these unfinished. Qasr uh, Tuba was never finished. You know, the Umayyads were, were crazy. They were building a lot of castles and a lot of forts and a lot of palaces, and they were never... Most of them, half of the ones in Jordan, were never finished. Uh, neither this one nor uh, the one in, near the airport, uh, um, um Here you see the winter, uh, the rain marks, all these angles between the mud, the fired brick, fired bricks, and then you have the grouting, and then you have the rain marks. And it's almost like a laser cut, you know, how the rain. Um, next. And of course, the archaeology from the northern desert, um, the Sephardic inscriptions. Next, but also how does how how basalt 
gives idea. This is a tying, uh, this is a, 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 a tension, um, um, you know, a ring at the bottom, at the, at the lower part of a tower in, in Mejval. And suddenly you have uh, this solution, which actually you can pull a car with a chain made out of basalt, because basalt is not like limestone. It can take much more tension. And this was a solution that is, uh, and of course this was all plastered. You know, they didn't care about the shape of it as much as, uh, and you can see the extreme right, one of the stones uh, snapped in some of the earthquakes, uh, the lower one the U-shape, it, it, it broke. Uh, but still, you know, I mean, of course, friction works with all the other courses. They behave a little bit like a chain, but this is really a deliberate, uh, very intentionally designed uh, chain to do a tension rod or tension ring, if you will, square ring or belt. Uh, next. Also, geology as shaping the uh, layout of the town. This is in Shobak. Um, an area called Jhayir, and uh, the village follows, you know, a certain uh, rock layer. Um, so each house is like partially a cave and then partially a house. Next. Also in my art, I'm interested in, in, in form and I'm interested in space and how can we um, turn the flat canvas into anatomy of a bedrock? Next. And that involves light and involves atmosphere. Again, it's all about, um, you know, the, the understanding so much that you can actually build an atmosphere. And I'm also in interested in, um, in geology or geomorphology and how can it actually um, work with added um, massing these are uh, imaginations of shrines that they don't exist. You know, I read about shrines and they don't exist. This is out of my own imagination that how would a shrine look if we, if it was built in Shobak. Uh, but I read texts about, you know, shrines from other places as well. But then I try to actually understanding the, um, the bedrock there and I start to actually imagine how it would have looked if it was built. Next, please. Next. This was a design that I did for a friend of mine in, uh, it's not far from Baccalauria. And um, his name is Salam in Amat. He was, uh, he's still, now he has a gallery in, in Baltimore in, in the US. I did, this was the first house I built in my, um, when I came back from US in 1986 is on the left, extreme left of the slide. You see that tower? Extreme left, there's a tower, uh, exactly. That's the uh, maid room with the boiler. And on, on to the left to it, there's the rest of the house, which is like a big courtyard house. But then uh, about four or five years ago, he wanted to do an art center, contemporary art center. So I designed uh, this uh, building for him, uh, which is not built. This is our um, rendering. We're, one day we will probably raise the funds and build it. Um, for, I would also probably join him as a, uh, with the idea. So the building is basically uh, using extra stones from uh, the workshops that we get for free, all the extra um, that they you know throw away. And it's almost like taking a bunch of spaghetti and breaking it. Um, next, please. So the, the main exhibition space is in that kind of hanging rock, a cantilevered, and below will be sculpture garden. And the entire design is just uh, cantilevered for like about 20 meter, and, uh, and that will allow us to have a uh, minimal footprint so that the space below is used. Um, and this is, we learn from trees. I mean, trees do that. Trees give us beautiful canopy, and their trunk is so small compared to the mass of the, of the crown. Other important uh, places, but this is uh, like a house in the rock uh, of a hermit, Byzantine. Uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's a place nobody knows. Uh, it's like between uh, Salt and the uh, uh, Jordan Valley. 
where hermit was living and uh, but also you have a lot of other examples of um, humans um, using architecture that nature gave for free and they did very middle very minimal addition next please another project that we were you know um, learning to uh, use extra um, stones that are thrown away yeah next please Next, please. This uh, place is um, very difficult to find, uh, and I don't tell people about it. It's actually uh, like way west of uh, Qatrani. Uh, you have to drive in a very rugged area, but uh, west of northwest of Gatrani, and uh, suddenly you have this amazing structure. It's not that old. This is like probably 1930s, built by shepherds, um, but it's very, very minimalist and contemporary. And uh, the way it uses the cantilever and have this amazing mass below it, uh, it's for me. This is my professor. This is my master. I learned this is where I learned how to be an architect is from places like, like this, where there's no decoration, it's just architecture of survival, solving problem. Architecture is about solving problems, it's not about decorating. This project I did about, uh, I would say, 32 years ago. Um, it's the Donna Guest House, and uh, um, it structurally was very challenging because the last five meter is uh, cantilevered. And about four years ago, we added another um, group of rooms to this building. But this is the first uh, beginning, and now it, 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 uh, the Royal Society decided to make uh, more. Uh, yeah, and then in Madhava, uh, the Apostle Church. This was this was built in nine in nineteen ninety. 394, 95, in mid 90s of last century, and it actually has one of some of the biggest, then biggest arches in uh, Jordan. 16 kilometer, uh, 16 meter uh, in, in, in span. Okay, Wadi okay. Finan, uh, Lodge. Next. And Wadi Finana was playing with the something that is not from Jordan. You know, these sticking stones like that are really Asir or Yemen. And there they use them to protect the mud uh, from being eroded. But here I am using them to shade, uh, self-shading, uh, shade the elevation, the southern and western elevation of the building. And this building actually uses a double shell um, um, roof, which has straw bale in the middle, about 30 centimeter of straw and um, shell, very thin ferro cement shell, and then straw and then another shell, so that we have maximum uh, insulation. Of course, these elevations move, you know, with the light every time of the day, and with the year, like in the uh, winter, the shadows are much less because the low the sun is lower and then we don't need the insulation anyway in the summer the sun is much vertical and then the shadow is is more complete and they move across the date uh, hours of the day next please and then while jordan i'm sure most of you know this building um and the whole idea of this building is to allow the landscape to grow underneath so the building has normally if you look at a cube and we so in a building we talk about four elevations and then the fifth elevation which is the roof but this one has a sixth it's like six elevation with the bottom you know the lower part so you can walk underneath and um, birds could fly and plants can go underneath and uh, and if you look at it uh, and your neighbor our, our neighbors to the right I actually take the same grain the same modular of 10 about 10 meter of the other buildings um, and now we are we might be constructing a 14-room uh, hotel in the legs below the building, and maybe out of wood and steel, uh, and they will be not flush, they will be back in, you know, so we, there might be addition of rooms in there. Um, 
So it's, it's a building that grows downward instead of upward. That's the front uh, elevation. And this is how I did the rendering. And you know, this was before, uh, I still do that actually. I don't operate uh, my, personally, I don't touch um, AutoCAD or any of these things. You know, I draw with a pencil and uh, I sit with uh, my, the team of the office. I, I know, I, I could guess that tools exist. They should do this or that. So I could actually command them what, what to get out of the computer. But, uh, but this is how, uh, you know, this is how the pre-computer rendering, uh, this was done you know, to the client. This was a competition, by the way, uh, which with me was Bilal Hamad and uh, uh, Akram Abu Hamdan and uh, um, um, Khaled Bahas and uh, Rami Dahar. Next, please. That was, if you go a slide be before, that was, a, 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 that was a design for Columbia University. There was a time that uh, Columbia was talking to the mayor of Amman and, uh, and the, the president of Columbia came and, you know, and I made this uh, early idea of making like a, a library that is flying, hovering above the entire thing and it looks like that. But then plans, you know, Colombia wanted a long lease for 30 years and uh, the government couldn't commit, so they withdrew. But this building is very strange because it's hanging away from the rock. It's actually, it hangs on like concrete nails. And I got the permission then from uh, mayor to actually dig under the, at, a, at an angle, at 40 degree angle, 45 degree, under the uh, outside the site you know under the street with the white car so it's like hanging a painting or a sculpture on a wall so it doesn't even touch the um, the uh, the house of uh, Ibrahim Hashim uh, below it next please so if you look on the on the left side I wanted to keep the bedrock um, the Amman Silicified limestone formation on the bedrock as is, and the building is hanging away, so the plants can even continue to grow. So it's um, it was very challenging. I looked at bones, uh, bird bones, and animal bones to actually get the better, the best profile and uh, section of of the um, of the columns. This will be built uh, in the coming month or two. We will start. It's not far. It's exactly near my office. It's in Abdoon. Uh, very close to Matam al Usra, and it's a, a park, and we will be building like a community, small community center uh, within the park. This is a sink of in my office uh, downstairs, and it's made from just one chunk of stone that uh, marble that uh, I drew on a pencil with the for the Egyptian workers, and they just actually carved it uh, in one chunk. Next. I actually design my sinks. I mean, uh, I think they're more exciting than the, most of the bigger architecture thing. This is a, a at, at the uh, Abu Ghazali, uh, MAG, Abu Ghazali Foundation uh, Center. And uh, it's actually made of just concrete and, uh, you know, hovering away from the wall. It's actually hanging about five centimeter away from the wall on steel rods. Uh, and it's made by very simple techniques and uh, next. But I'm interested in, I love concrete and I'm interested in pushing concrete into doing things that it didn't, it couldn't do before. Next. Or like concrete furniture and how thin can we go and how light can we go. This was rendering for the Wadi Hidan Center. Next please. And this has, you know, a, a lot of structural challenges with concrete. This was uh, during construction. Next. And this is a, a, a shading pergola made out of uh, galvanized steel. Um, very simple, low tech, uh, but the result is um, rather exciting because it, it looks like it, it gives um, like almost a laser show 
when you walk underneath it and uh, a lot of visual surprises it looks to me it surprised me when it's finished because it looks like a piece of installation sculpture That was a um, shuttering model for sh uh, scaffolding that we've done for the well the Hidan bridge, which spans about 50 meter. And this is how to show the uh, contractor how to avoid, uh, you know, the river uh, floods destroying the shuttering. Next, and this is how the uh, shuttering was done. In fact, this um, this uh, scaffolding was destroyed. And uh, after after the destruction of the of that, we did the model that you saw before, because actually uh, he built this and then it was a big flood and uh, he was lucky he didn't start the stone uh, building, so, and half of that wood was uh, crushed and uh, thrown into the Dead Sea. So then he waited um, till the weather became better. And anyway, this is why, why this is the um, Ajnoon Academy, and this arch is thirty meter. 30 meter is like as big as the dome of the Hagia Sophia in uh, Istanbul. Um, it, this building is based on a quarry, um, and the quarry is um, has been abandoned since the um, like mid 90s. And I actually uh, wanted to use the exact profile of the quarry as an elevation. And here you can see the concrete going to um, a one centimeter or just zero, almost like a blade, like a knife. Um, next. And that edge, the very thin edge, saw it breaks a little bit, and the contractor was very worried. And I said, ah, you know, I don't care. Just think of it like a torn piece of paper. And um, maybe um, another 10 years, it will break a little bit more. But I think it will stop when it's about three centimeter thick. It will stop, and um, you know. But now it's it's surprising that it's still very very sharp and. Uh, Also here, I took the stone um, into a zero edge. Um, so it looks like Photoshop. I mean, if you if you go to the site and you don't see any thickness because the last stones are really cut into a 30 degree angle. Same here, if you see the shut, the concrete um, um, louvers, uh, they just also go to, you know, very simple. And these are built by simple workers. It's not like a, you know, a, a, a very, you know, high, highly skilled. Uh, I just explain something and I accept the surprise uh, and I accept the limitation of material. I design to the simple abilities of construction. Next, please. Also here, I am interested in pulling my foundation away from the forest. This why a lot of these structural decisions are the result of a smaller footprint, smaller foundation, and thus very much like what trees do, um, we actually calculate the amount of concrete if the column is vertical and the tie beams and the destruction, and then we calculate if we go, if we go 45, and then we discover that going at this angle and pulling away from the forest is cheaper, plus the contour line because the forest goes down. Uh, in... Next, please. Next. Here I'm interested in light, and uh, this is a central corridor, and I was interested in how nature actually um, um, teases light, you know, how light and texture are playing together. And to me, it makes like a sound, you know, when nature, when light falls on these sharp edges, it's like water falling on sharp edges, you know, it's, um, it, it's very interesting how we can make a um, very good solution. and. Obviously, it, nature does it in another way, uh, but um, you know, I, I pick up ideas and uh, give them another life. I think we finished, no? Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Architect Ammar. Okay, so we're going to be open to any questions. Uh, whoever likes to ask something. Could I start, Claudine, please? Yes, what then? Uh, Ammar. Uh, oh, Alan. First of all, I would like to tell everybody who's watching us. No, thank you. <laughs> that Ammar is, uh, in my opinion, he's a guy who cares about landscape of Jordan as well as a well-versed person in reading Jordan landscapes. And I am proud of all of his work and what he has done, but most importantly, how he investigates and how he researches the works before he starts. He's uh, less is more. He deals with simplicity, and I think Ammar is a renowned architect, not in Jordan, but in our region, and he had put a good print in the vocabulary. The second thing that I found interesting in the way he deals with places and spaces, understanding, and he said a few things I'd like our students and our colleagues to follow up. Amar still and always have a passion for drawing and painting and the one thing that I was shocked, he went to the Hamada region and in one of the videos he displayed bringing Hijar Suwan and trying with a colleague of his or her, I, don't, I forgot the name, try to come up with the music playing on these stones. Creativity comes from nature. Creativity comes from working hard, but he still draws with hand, and this is a passion that I always love to do. I just would like to commend you publicly on what you have done, and I always have been speaking about a person who really puts Jordan. If Jafar and Rasin played an important role in the region, Ammar comes in, in his own special way to lead as an artist, designer, architect, landscape architect, because he follows the grand masters of designing from the ashtray to the chair, not only the architecture, the interior. I think he is well versed. I have enjoyed what I have seen, what I have seen his work. I passed through the finance things. I adore the way he works with our natural and man natural uh, God created as a landscape. Thank you, Ammar. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Kamel. This is like um, coming from you is really an honor uh, to me to uh, you know to have this opinion from somebody of your status. Um, I let, let me actually stress one point that was mentioned. You you cannot be a good architect without a small notebook in your pocket. A diary. Not, not a telephone, not a, because when you take a photo, you don't see. You are looking at other stuff. But Sketch without a pencil and a simple, a small notebook in your back pocket, you cannot be a good architect. And you cannot, you cannot wait till your professor, I'm, I'm, I'm telling students, you cannot wait till your professor sends you to, do, uh, to take notes. You should be breathing notes and train your eye to look at things and drawing not when you have an assignment all your life or otherwise if you cannot be an architect it's true that's why for the last 35 years i have more than 140 sketchbooks and they are my life and i adore them exactly it is true and now a lot of students and some of faculty members all over the world and in the arab world mainly they still believe that computer-generated drawings could lead. It's a tool to develop your work. Later. It's yes. not a tool to design your work. Thank you. I rest my case. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, actually, it's an important point about sketching and drawing. Um, drawing is not about producing the product. It's about the process. Drawing is a checklist of your vision. It's a checklist that your eye has followed the lines of the subject that you're drawing. So draw and throw them away. I don't care, you don't, you don't need to even uh, do anything with them. You, if you want to memorize a building, draw it. It doesn't have to be a beautiful drawing. So drawing is 
is actually training your, your eye to follow the outline, follow the volume, understanding the volume. So drawing is reading, it's not producing, you know. This is very important and we don't do this when we use any computer because you, 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 you know, this ancient technique of the eye following a profile of something and then training your ne neurology where your hand is in tune with your eye at the same speed and movement if you don't go through this experience, you can never design anything. It's true. I do agree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nanda Samar, we have a question from Jude Tuan, one of our students. She's asking about the Hellenistic tomb, if she's not mistaken. Yeah, without yeah. a drain, it should be. Yeah. Uh, Jude? Monastic, the mon monastic she's asking about... Uh, yes. Uh, she's asking about... Um, I think this is it, Sahar Jude. Uh, yes, Yatik Al-Afiyah, Mohandas. But can you tell the location? I'd like to know more about the location of this Hellenistic tomb with the drain, uh, the water drainage slit on top, if you don't mind. Me too. If it's a Hellenistic. Yeah. Yeah, this is in a place called... Um, um, for Huda. And it's actually, okay. actually uh, and if, and, and a closer place uh, uh, called uh, and if you Sa'da. go from uh, Nabi Osha towards uh, Alam, uh, you actually, if you leave Nabi Osha, it's, let's say you're going to Deir Allah uh, or, or Arda, Tariq Al Arda, uh, you have to leave, uh, it's just below, it's actually. It's actually below the, the plateau below the first plateau below Nabi Yocha in Jabal Jabal Salt. Uh, and there's a small town well, there. Uh, that village has disappeared completely, and uh, I don't know. It's still there. I have now the phobia of going to places that I have been in the ten fifteen years. Jordan ago is falling apart. People are destroying everything. Yes, th uh, thank you very much. Ooh, uh, thank you so much for this foundational lecture, truly. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, Amar, uh, first let me to admire you for your excellent use of the terminology. I am discovering something I couldn't understand that you can speak as an archaeologist as an architect as i don't know how but your terminology you you used make me that to return back to the uh, greek language the latin language your terminology is excellent and this is i believe that it is part of your uh, uh, character that give you passion for a lot of uh, let us say a relation with the nature this is first Thank you. The second thing, yani, uh, when discussing about um, music, Der Alla, the double arch, and Basha uh, near the Amal Aliyah University, Al uh, Qatrani, uh, I remember that I, ha I have been for a reviewer for uh, a Spanish article about um, acoustic of the Neolithic period. And I believe that these uh, spaces are re related to acoustics. And uh, uh, we would like again to make a research about this because there is no archaeologist uh, cares about archaeoacoustics. This uh, section of interesting as a architect and as uh, specialist now for me in uh, tracing the music of the stones. I believe that there is an opinion that there is a, a reason for selection these sites for uh, acoustics which is related to the music. The second thing that I would like uh, about the Apostle Church. Sometimes, uh, teaching my students, we discuss this approach. And let me I mean, be very 
clear with you about some principles of conservation about reversibility. I would like now, after how many years, to tell you or the students your opinions about this experience. But I admire you today, not as an architect, as you, and the knowledge, and this is very important for an architect to use this terminology as a scientist, because an architect should know a lot of things, including uh, the nature, the uh, geology, geomorphology, the material, even philosophy. And you are a philosopher for me. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, two, two notes very quickly. The, um, I, think, I think what happened um, with us in the last uh, century or so that the, uh, the architecture has been hijacked by the visual process Mm -hmm. On the uh, uh, against the the other uh, sense, which is the uh, which is the acoustics, and I think um, it's much much more important um, that if we use our hearing sense, because mm -hmm. hearing has to do with space much more than eye. You know, the, the eye is is a problem. It, what happened lately with with all this iconic architecture and all this you know without mentioning names, you know, uh, star architects. They all actually start competing for public, being public, pub, you know, published in magazines and media. And I think architecture has been hijacked by the eye in a, in a very terrible way uh, and a dis disservice to architecture. And I think that uh, we must again bring the ear back as a, um, as a sense that is more important because ears can sense space. You know, uh, for me, uh, I am very much into uh, acoustics and psychoacoustics. And what, why do we, you know, and why different uh, spaces sound differently, and how can we receive a space by the ear, not by the eye? I would love to actually teach a, a course for architecture for the blind, and I will make sure that all the students are only blind students. You know that they can only feel because you can teach you can teach um, sculpture i mean you can actually have a blind sculpture because you know sculpture could touch the, the blind person could touch a sculpture but i i would love to give a course um, of uh, architecture for blind students every one of them and see how they you will come sorry so again, I, I, I think I think this is a very tricky point that is very important. And uh, the Apostles' Church, there was a lot of debate about uh, discussion with Acor, and when we you know, that shelter had there was a shelter before actually of uh, of with columns and you know columns of concrete and it looked like a chicken shed uh, which I removed, and then we created these arches that are span they span outside the church. I mean uh, the spans are. The arches are like 16 meter span, and the church is like 20. It's the church is like 15 meter uh, from end to end. So you could actually, it is reversible if you insist. We could remove them uh, without jackhammer because they are not reinforced concrete. Removing them is um, you have to re-install um, a shattering, and then you can actually remove um, pulling the stones away uh, without any um, jackhammer because we don't have solid reinforced concrete uh, that needs to be shattered. But it's, it's not easily, it's not really a, 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 it's not a reversible, easily reversible building. This building was designed uh, and we got the money from USAID, from American government, as a labor intensive uh, for employment. So it was designed to make maximum labor, to employ maximum people without, without, without a contractor and without using uh, much steel. In the uh, so the arches actually are purely masonry arches, and they're made from extra stones that we took from the uh, for free from the uh, stone uh, cutting work workshops. So this is, I mean, of course later there were other, you know, Lin Fakhuri did the other structure with the burnt palace. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, discussion mm -hmm. on that. What is the best for archaeology? So yeah, I know, and in that time, but sometimes a lot of visitors doesn't. Um, uh, understand the old and the new part uh, if they are passing in front. Yes, true. Actually, this actually, is another yeah, issue. Yeah, true. But you know, in the Apostle Church, 
which was excavated mm. in the 60s. Actually, it was a flat. Apostles' Church has nothing old except the mosaic, and it was purely a field, a wheat field. You know, it was zero structures above. Mm. And when the Madaba people yeah. from Karak in the uh, late, uh, you know, 1880s, uh, mm. they actually had whatever remaining stones were left uh, in that location of the Apostles' Church was were removed. So Apostle Church has zero vertical walls, nothing, nothing. So, you okay. know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Thank but the other one. Only to clarify before no, no, the discussion. No. Uh, even in my class, always. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Naif. Uh, we, we have a question from um, Kauthar Rayyan. Melissa Kauthar. If you'd like to ask it yourself, please open the mic. Oh, yeah, hello. Uh, Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for this event. Um, I would like to ask about Abu Sayyah site. It's really interesting. I've never um, had the opportunity to know about how the process of making columns back in the times. And it's wonderful to have this site uh, in Jordan. And I was uh, like, because you have just touched the, 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 the topic of like uh, the authority or the government are not allowing to do something on the site the question like if you can talk more about it or are they planning to destroy it somehow or just not act upon it okay no it's uh, the site is about i've done uh, some um, uh, land survey I, I looked at the land survey um, you know uh, app and uh, looked at the it, it's about maybe 30 kilometer that 30 no 30 sorry 30 dunums uh 30, 000 square meter uh, of the land that that has a lot of these, um, I, I would say maybe fifty or a hundred uh, unfinished column. Uh, some of them are only marks, and others are almost complete. They look like when you open a cigar box, you know, and you have all these parallel, you know, columns that are still. And there are some columns that are, you know, they were abandoned and broken in the middle of the wadi. The area is a dump. It's full of garbage. Um, it's surrounded by, uh, you know, scrap, scrap, uh, you know, where they throw all the old cars. And so the area um, is. I don't know if any of it is has been uh, going through istimlak. I doubt. I, I'm not sure if the Department of Antiquity or Ministry of Tourism owns any of the land. I have no idea. I've asked. Uh, it, it's not expensive. It, they should do immediate eminent domain, istimlak, and they should actually uh, use, you know, their power. They use. They should use the antiquity law to actually buy, force people to sell, you know, istimlak, which means eminent domain. You buy by force, uh, and you give people the right, you know, um, estimation, um, and then it's safe and protected. Uh, otherwise, uh, I have no clue how if all of it or most of it is owned by by people and uh, then they have the right to actually build on the site or bulldoze it or remove um, you know these very rare very very rare i mean forget about palmyra forget about jarash these are remains of the process of extracting and and, and taking columns and shaping columns and uh, and it's, it lays in a very important geological formation called Al-Hisa uh, Phosphorite uh, formation, which is made from a lot of shell in geology we call coquina. It's like a lot of oyster, big oyster shells that are stuck together, which gave a structural property for the columns, including some ten tensile uh, properties. And this is why it was in high demand, because th those columns are much stronger than just simple uh, sedimentary rock that is uh, free of, of shell, this big oyster shell. So the, the, the story is very, very important, very complex uh, combination of geology uh, uh, from, um, from ancient uh, paleo shorelines of the Tithis Ocean, um, um, on top of it, you have the, the, the you know, uh, let's say, 2 century BC to, to 2 century AD uh, human um, record of extracting those megaliths, those huge, you know, st columns, some of them 
are of a diameter of about one and a half meter or two meter. I mean, those are like, you know, uh, there was a project in, um, from ACOR um, about 15 years ago, and there was an, in, um, in, uh, an architect uh, from Greece, a Greek architect that was brought by the Americans to actually reconstruct the Temple of Hercules in Jabal Qala in the citadel. And I was helping actually to locate the source because the stone there is more rose color. It has a reddish color, but has different kind of shell, smaller shell. So I was actually using paleontology, which is fossils, to actually uh, locate the possibility of the ancient source so we can take, we can bring new material for the partial reconstruction. Of course, you know, in archaeology, uh, reconstruction is not. Uh, acceptable but in in that was that partial reconstruction was made to explain the height and some columns of the temple of hercules were erected with using titanium rods and it's fantastic it's a beautiful job done but again i i think this is one of the most important sites and for me more important is that it's near in east amman where all the less privileged people um, it will be an amazing uh, educational park we can put a stone, architectural stone research slash uh, craft uh, center that teaches people how to be a good uh, stone makers, and not exactly on the site, but attached to it, next to it. Uh, it can be an amazing park with an international reputation, but nobody cares. Nobody cares. Yeah, I'm asking because I'm doing my PhD now and I'm really interested in incorporating those cultural heritage uh, sites that we have in Amman, especially in the area that you have mentioned, east of Amman, south of Amman. We have he like a lot of those sites that is not on the map or not considered to be valuable in order to make, like as you said, like a park for people just to acknowledge the history and the importance of that aspect. And um, I really want to add, like I used a lot of your paintings um, for one of my classes to introduce the, the landscape of Jordan, and it was amazing. Yeah, I had a lot of feedback and kind of uh, impressive um, um, uh, comments and discussion about just three of your paintings. And I just wanted to uh, put that uh, for your uh, concern. Well, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you. If you want to help, you know, I've, I've given up. I don't have, I don't, I don't lobby anymore. I've given up. Uh, <laughs> younger generation are interested. I can give all the information. And then, you know, you could, you could write. I could help you with even addresses and connections. Maybe you could get, amazing. Take, take a proposal to the Getty Foundation, um, get the money, and then we can corner the government, tell them, look, we have, you have everything. And you only have to act, and uh, you, you can do this. I'm not. I'm not going to do it. I've given up. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the offer. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question from. Um, I have the name as El Hadidi. Uh, if you're there and you would like to please ask your, such, your the question yourself, unmute yourself and ask it. Brian is asking. Nice. Hi, um, so it's my name is Ibrahim Al Hadidi. Um, I'd like to thank you, Omar, uh, for the amazing um, presentation. And I'd like to thank, obviously, everyone who's made this possible. And I'd like to thank Dr. Kamil Mahadeen as well for commending this to me. Uh, now, I have a few questions, a couple of questions actually, both related. You spoke in the beginning about the ethno archaeology being kind of your approach, uh, the design process. And throughout the talk, you did talk a lot about how archaeology or how a lot of your work does involve the process of, you know, um, excavating, rediscovering, and so forth. And I've seen that a lot. But then the ethnographic part or the anthropological part is the, the one that I was curious to hear you maybe elaborate a little bit more about because I'm doing my PhD in vernacular architecture studies and dealing with how we can preserve vernacular buildings um, as living heritage. And so I'm interested in the anthropological approach, how that informs your design process. And the second part is I heard you do this um, or, or, or mention how in the past there was a very almost conscious, shy approach to dealing with um, the natural environment and almost, you know, trying to adapt uh, 
just as much as they need as opposed to what people are doing today. And it makes me kind of think, what do you think about the current vernacular trends, if you were to call them so, and do we have anything to learn from them as architects today? And I'm talking about people building for themselves, not architects recreating the traditional vernacular. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, very important two points. In anthropology, uh, you have tools uh, that deal with kinship, family, uh, like, you know, um, um, central family, extended family, and how, a, how kinship shapes a courtyard house, or how food processes, you know, how um, in, in, from anthropology you have things like ethnobotany, you know, the knowledge of people, uh, in, of, of traditional people of their plants for medicinal use and for food, and then food processes. And then in anthropology you have things like gender dif differences between, like the entire Bedouin tent, for example, is, is, is split between male and female items in the tent. For example, in the Bedouin tent, the female do the weaving, never the men, never. So weaving is a female job. Forget the upright looms of commercial upright, upright rooms of, uh, of, of urban um, Aleppo or, or Madaba. I'm saying weaving a Bedouin tent, the weaving is purely uh, a female task, while the wood is pre purely a male task. So the entire uh, Bedouin uh, tent um, um, anatomy could be split uh, uh, across gender, uh, male or female. The same thing with the Fallahi house. For example, all the arches, all the masonry, all the stone is male. All the mud lining, all the plaster, all the mud furniture is female. So it, it, there's, a, there's a gender division. This is what you learn from anthropology. These are the tools that our anthropology gives, but architect, architecture doesn't. I mean, we were taken to Arisha to sit and live for, live with, 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 the, with the sheikhs of Ruwala, Sha'lan, uh, already in 1988 with um, uh, William Lancaster, who was the guy who wrote about them and he, he lived with them and, um, and he was my professor at Yarmouk University, Mahad al Athar al Anthropology. So to learn, we sat, we, we lived there for like a week to learn how many kilometer you need for how many camels and how many camels you need for a tribe and how a tribe is distributed on the landscape and and that's that's actually master planning you know it's a, it's it's zone zoning it's it's to understand how the the nomadic zoning is different from a village zoning and i i think you know anthropology is and sociology, of course, if you're dealing with urban living, because anthropology dovetails and weaves into sociology. Those two disciplines have been neglected in the last 20 years, and now they are picking up life again, because governments are noticing that they actually can avoid a lot of mistakes. You cannot do master planning, or you cannot do um, even house planning, even spatial planning or programming of uh, any space without some knowledge of um, anthropology and sociology and, of course, psychology and all kinds of other human. Uh, but, but again, you know, um, from anthropology we studied um, about materials, technologies, uh, about uh, um, economical systems and about uh, also models of uh, uh, you know, um, matrilocal, patrilocal, um, like in marriage, sometimes in other communities. Um, in Jordan, for example, uh, the, the female, the bride comes to the male's house. In India, the male goes to the female house. And this is all about labor, you know, it's all about, uh, you know, the, the landscape. And it's, it's very, very interesting and very um, wide to toolbox. Um, you know, 100 times bigger toolbox than what architects have. And uh, if you're dealing with vernacular architecture, um, but you have to be careful, you can get lost because it's really a huge toolbox and um, you have to know what you need to understand better um, um, the, 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 the existing, let's say, fabric. The other a question you asked is about um, um, 
you know, I'm not into those who are copying um, vernacular architecture, becomes a style. Okay, it's nice. You do always need a, a wide menu. So if you go in a restaurant, you, you, you need maybe to have a homemade pasta, you know, as well. So there is a, a, a line of architecture which I call hippie architecture. I don't mind it. I like it. Um, I, I don't like to do it myself. And I don't like to be against it. Um, you know, homemade homes. Um, I don't think we can do that anymore. I don't like we, when we are copying the looks of that uh, as a style. Um, and uh, there are, you know, uh, people who are his, into history, bringing back history and doing some kind of architecture that looks, you know, I don't know, Ottoman or I've, I've done, um, I've done uh, Ottoman looking architecture because like in Pella and in Qais and uh, in these two sites because they were labor intensive. I didn't want to use uh, steel and I, it was the, the money I got from US aid was on the condition that I convinced them actually and to get the fund. To, to employ maximum people and um, not bring the money back to the city as construction materials. So, so I'm I'm not into any architecture that is mimicking an image or mimicking a style. Or uh, for me, this is not architecture; it becomes just you know a visual um, exercise. Um, I think uh, we can learn a lot from vernacular architecture. And I think what is making us very bad um, designers is our ability to build those and our ability to pump concrete before people use even the early concrete in the till the 70s or 80s. People used to carry it on their shoulder, so we were careful. Now we bring those ready mix uh, pumps on the you phone. You, you pick up the phone, and they are ready. They'll come in in 10 minutes. You know, or you can tell them tomorrow at 10. They, tomorrow you have five of these mixtures in front of your house and you can cast anything anywhere so this is the scary part that that we are so able we are destructively able this is the problem uh, thank you uh, we have another question from Hanna Kutti Hanna uh, Hanna would you like to ask yes. a question? thank you Claudine um, thank you, Mohandas Ammar, uh, for this inspirational presentation. Um, my question to you, sir, is uh, recently, uh, uh, and by and by recently, I mean probably two years ago, um, they have discovered or they announced uh, that archaeologists have discovered the oldest loaf of bread uh, uh, in the Jordanian desert. And during your presentation, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, there was a slide uh, with a loaf of bread, uh, but we didn't get to hear about it. I just uh, would like to know if it's the same one and if you've visited the site or if the discovery have contributed uh, any new knowledge about the architectural about the architecture of that uh, of that time. Because I think the report stated that it was pre agricultural uh, revolution. If um, and I hope I'm not I'm not uh, mistaken. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. For, thanks for the question. Yes, um, the in uh, I think in the year two, 2018, uh, they, they uh, some um, some um, a declaration of the most important ten archaeological discoveries globally had Jordan among them from the uh, Shbeka uh, site of which the earliest bread uh, has been discovered and the bread uh, is not loaves it's more like little biscuits and little bits and pieces shattered and uh, but the important thing is that in the reports and excavation they found the 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 uh, the, the baking Apparatus is not just the bread. They found the entire apparatus, you know, like nice baking uh, ovens, if you will, like pits that are really built properly, that have the ashes, and and they're obviously doing a lot of bread. And the, the big shock is that we assumed wrongly, obviously, that bread was the result of agriculture. So so bread came after human settled, let's say in Ain Ghazal one of the earliest settlements, uh, 
which was like 10,000 years ago. But here in Shbeka, they found bread that is 14 and a half, it's 14,400 14, years. This is the date they found very accurately, rather accurately, because bread is organic, which means it can do carbon-14 dating rather in a good way. And there was now new, more dating that can do with other technologies like luminescence, more weird stuff that gives you the last year, the grains of sand, so light. It's another um, technique that there's a fantastic Jordanian uh, scholar working in China and Jordan on it. Uh, his name is Mahmoud Abbas. You can check him on Facebook. So the the dating is rather accurate, is, is 14,000. 400. And that is a period of, of a very important um, archaeological uh, revolution uh, called the Natufian, Natufian, Google Natufian uh, civilization, which was a sudden, um, a, if, if you will, explosion of creativity and, and decoration on bones. And so suddenly humans became very creative. You know, and a lot of people now say that is the reason that um, later they start settling. And uh, so, what shocked everybody is that bread is not to be connected to to uh, domestication of animals and plants. And bread is is before the single species of grain. So this bread was made from a lot of harvesting of different grains together. But you have to tie the entire story to paleoclimate, because this is the time that was the end of the glacier, the last glacier retreating. And the last glacier, before it ended, the eastern Jordanian desert and the western parts of Saudi Arabia, from here entire, all the way into, almost to the edges of, of uh, Najd, was actually full of hundreds of lakes and, and animals. And it was like a savanna, it was a grassland. And I think the retreat of the of the um, uh, of the last glacier made a, a lot of natural single species carpeting of wild wheat. And um, the British Institute is working. Carol Palmer is one of the most important uh, working on that subject. Uh, I can connect you to her if you want this more data scientific on, on that subject. Uh, looking at the ancient domestication of, of grains, um, which all started here, and uh, and this story really shocked very deep into the human knowledge. I tell you, if something will be in the textbooks of of schools of the entire world, it will not come from Petra. It will come from Eastern Desert, and it will not come from on Jerash. It will come from a site that looks like a pile of stone in the Eastern Desert. <clears throat> so Shbeka is is an important. Now what you have seen the other below that I didn't comment is actually uh, this is where anthropology works. This is where ethnoarchaeology works very well, because in the very ancient we look at what shepherds do, because shepherds actually bake bread very much like Shbeka. This is uh, the bread that you saw is called the arbud. That image was taken from east of Karak. Um, an area, beautiful, you know, parts of, of villages around, you know, Karak that are un unbelievable. And um, this, uh, the, the, this is the Arbud, which is the how the shepherds make pre-yeast bread, because yeast is a later development. And so this is how, um, you know, um, yeast is, yeast is basically domestication of bacteria. You know, it's it's like we don't we didn't even domesticate just animals and plants. We also domes, domesticated microbes, you know, that were not not uh, you know not corona. Um, <laughs> the, the ones that are good for us, like yogurt and yeast and the beer and wine and these are all living you know uh, yeast that we picked from nature and we domesticated them and made them uh, do jobs for us. Yeast is to make bubbles in the bread. So the arbud, this is the arbud, and the guy here is hitting the arbud with a stick to get rid of the uh, ashes. The arbud is basically um, bread, very crude bread made by the shepherds, and it's buried in. in, in, in they make a big fire and they um, they, they bury they bury it. It's not it's not roasted on top. You know, it's buried in the in, in the in the fire. They actually take the fire away. But by then, the soil is and the earth 
is so hot, so they bury it almost like zarb, if you will, but thin, uh, not too deep. I see. Okay. Thank you, Mohandas. Thank you. Thank you, Hanna. We have another question from Adnan Nabulsi. Adnan, would you like to ask your question, please? Adnan, oh, if you... Yes. Thank you, Ammar and the members of the Ammar and the members of the Ammar. I'm not a student of the Ammar and the Ammar. وفعلاً يعني إشي أكثر من رائع الإشي اللي عم بصير ونعمة من نعم الكورونا علينا بس حاب أسأل مهندس عمار سؤال هسا أنا كطالب كيف بقدر أدخل بالمورفولوجي أكثر سواء ككتب أو محاضرات أو يعني في كثير عدة أمور ممكن بتفيدنا فيها وحالياً يعني إحنا بعصر نقدر يعني المعلومات كلها بسهولة ممكن نوصل لها وبرضو في كمان سؤال الباترنز تعون الطبيعة نحكي الاف الباترنز كيف بقدر اسير افهم لها او انظر لها بنظره معماريه اقدر جد انه مثلا تساعدني في الديزاين بروسيس ويعطيكم العافيه طيب شكرا هلا انا يعني اذا لاحظت كنت بحاول استعمل كثير تيرمينولوجي بالانجليزي لسبب مهم للطلاب انه كثير مهم ان يتعلموا الطلاب كيف يستعملوا جوجل. جوجل هي كل مكتبات العالم، كل الدنيا يعني انتم كثير محظوظين، يعني انا لما كنت بعمركم كنت اروح على المكتبه وايدي تصير كلها غبره وادخل على الاندكس تبع الكتب يعني كارثه، يعني هلا هلا انت على جوجل بتقدر تحط اربع كلمات بتقدر تحط مثلا فرعوني فرعونيك او ايجيبشن وغارليك وكوزماتيك كوزماتكس او هير تريتمنت بس اربع كلمات جوجل بفتش كل مكتبات العالم على كل شيء فرعوني وكل شيء له علاقه بالتومي وكل شيء علاقه له علاقه بمساحيق التجميل اوكي okay? وبيعطيك النتائج تقاطع ثلاث هاي الحكي بدك تضوع 10 سنين من حياتك تروح على المكتبات من قبل فعندك باور يعني عمرها ما كانت موجوده عندنا بس السؤال المهم نفس الشيء انه مرات عم بتضيع لانه الداتا مش شطاره كثر الداتا مرات كثرة الداتا هي اكشلي كيوس يعني كثير مهم انه تمسك طرف خيط بكلمات سيرش مهمه وبعد فتره رح تكتشف في مواقع مهمه عم تشتغل بس على المورفولوجي تبع نيتشر للاستعمالات المعمار رح تكتشف في ويب سايتس شغلتها مع جامعات في ستودنتس في بروفيسورز في في مكاتب عم تشتغل بس على الموضوع يعني انا نصيحتي لك تبدا ب سيرش بكلمه كثير سهله اللي هي بايو ميمكري بايو احياء ميمك يعني تقليد الاحياء او او تاخذ افكار اخذ ال- ال- الاستفاده من تصاميم كانت وما زالت تقوم فيها فيها الاحياء من اخر آه يعني الاحياء عمالها بتصمم نحكي من اخر 500 مليون سنه آه واحنا بدينا نصمم يعني من آه من وقت الشبيكه الخبز تبع آه العصر آه 14000 سنه يعني يعني الاحياء كثير قبلنا يعني النمل الفراش الشجر ومش بس فورم يعني بدنا ندير بالنا بايوميمكري هي كيميكال هي فورم هي ستراكشرال هي بروسيس يعني سوورم ثيوري uh, هي كوميونيكيشن يعني هي بايوميمكري هلا عم بيستعملوها بالافيشن بالطائرات بالاسلحه بالجيش بالبحوث العسكريه والتصاميم الاخطر شغلات كله بايوميمكري وبالعماره يعني اذا اذا بدك تبدا كشو اللي بشكل المواد كيف الشكل العظم الطير بالنسبه لعظم الحصان وليش عظم الطير فاضي من جوا وكيف عشان يقدر يطير يعني يعني قصص كثير مهمه بتقدر تبدا فيها يعني حط بايوميمكري اركتكشر بس هالكلمتين وهي رح تفتح عليك ابواب منيحه بايوميمكري اركتكشر كمان ممكن تبلش ب موضوع بنسميه جنريتيف ديزاين جنريتيف انه كيف هلا المعماري المستقبل بطل هو يصمم آه اي شكل هو صار يصمم بروسيس آه كيف تقدر تعمل انت 
روبوت والروبوت هذا تحطه على 3D printer و 3D printer والروبوت ينحطه على درون ويصير هو عماله ما بيصمم التصميم تعامله هو بروح على موقع وهو بياخذ قرار اوكي يعني هون عم ندخل باشياء شوي اصعب هلا الموضوع مش سهل لانه هاي الدخلات آه مرات ما بتطعم خبز لانه المشكله انه مرات بدك بدك تتخرج وخلص تعمل مجمع اسكان ولا صف مخازن بطريق شارع الجاردنز والزبون ما عنده وقت لهيك حكي بس انا خايف انه من هون عشر سنين رح يصير في ابس وسوفت وير والعماره اللي عم نعملها هلا رح تنتهي لانه بنزل انا اب بحكي له بدي اربع غرف وحمام وبدي كذا واعطيني احسن مكان فزيع نايس ثانك يو ثانك يو وي هاف ا كويستشن فروم خالد البشير مع عمر في الحد اهلا شكرا عمر على المحاضره ايه شو اسمه عندي عندي سؤال بما يتعلق باللي عم نعيشه هلا انت وينك؟ انا هون عمان اه والله؟ اه والله قعدنا كم سكر حدود الحمد لله ايه شو اسمه إيه عندي سؤال بما يتعلق باللي عم نعيشه هلا يعني الى حد ما في تحول اجتماعي عم بيصير في اكيد تحول اقتصادي يعني بدري الواحد يحكي في عمل بعيد عن الموقع وان شاء الله انه يكون شيء شيء مش دائم بس بس انا سؤالي انه هل بشكل انت برايك مساءلات لطبيعه فضاءاتنا ومدننا وعلاقتنا مع الطبيعه وفي امكانيات اكتشفناها هلا ممكن ناخذها معنا بعد بعد الحجر يعني؟ لا يعني انا مش مع انه هلا نعمل بانيك ونرجع نحكي انه كل بيوتنا غلط يعني احنا في بيوتنا كانت غلط بكورونا وبلا كورونا يعني اللي ما عنده تيرس وما عنده بالكوني ومأزز البلكونه وخانق حاله وعامل كان غلط حتى كان غلط بس لا بجوز يعني الاهم انه كورونا فرجاء انه غلط وفرجاء غلط مش لانه مش لانه ما عنده كورت يارد فرجاء انه حياته كله غلط لانه بقعد شو البيت اساسا يعني في ناس هلا تعرفت على اولادها من وراء كورونا اوكي فالكان مشكله مش معماريه وانا مش مع رياكشن هلا تو بانيك وهيك اي ثينك اي ثينك اتس اي ثينك كورونا از ذا لاست ايبيديميك اي دونت ثينك هيومانيتي ويل الاو ذس تو هابن كمان مره لانه بوينغ على ماريوت على الستوك ماركت نو no واي يعني هذول يعني لو نحط 1% من المصاري انحطت على الويبنري والاسلحه انصرفت وتصنعت باخر 10 سنين لو 1% انحطت على على لكم عالم يعني مسكين ميتين من الجوع بيشتغلوا على الفيروسز كان هلا ما في مشكله فكورونا مش مشكله زي ما اجى راح راح يروح مش قصه يعني اي دونت ثينك وي شود رياكت لهالدرجه احنا كان عندنا مشاكل اكبر كورونا بجوز كشفت انه عندنا المشاكل آه يعني منها منها انه بنقدر نشتغل آه 20% اقل وهدول 20% اقل ما بفرق كثير بالعكس وي كان باي اور لايف يعني ال 20% بنقدر نعرف فيها اصحابنا واهلنا وهوبيز ونطلع نمشي و... وانا كثير مع فكره انه هلا يعني مثلا سعر البنزين بالاردن يرفعوه 100% بس يخلوا اوبر وكريم والتاكسيات يخلوهم بسعر مدعوم والببليك ترانسبورتيشن بسعر مدعوم والباقي بواحد بيطلع سياره يفكر 10 مرات ويعمل يوم الجمعه والسبت يعني اللي بيطلع بيدفع زي كونجشن شارج تبع لندن عرفت شو قصدي؟ لانه الشوارع عمان هلا كثير حلوه وانا مبسوط عليها فيعني عم تعطي افكار شوي بندعس بركات بس ما اظني محرز انه يعني نصمم هلا شيء عشان كورونا لانه بجوز بكره يجيك يعني فيروس بينتقل بالمي ولا بشيء ثاني عرفت كيف؟ سوري بس كنت بسال استاذ عمار when he was talking about this the last glaciers Um, and the bread was this during the are we talking about the younger dries or before again again um, so when you're talking about the bread and how the grains that it was made from different grains and that was a period before 
uh, before um, agriculture, was that before the Younger Dryas? So before 10,000 BC, we're talking. Yes, yes. The bread, again, the bread is dated, uh, Natufian period, the bread is dated 14,400 years. Had a okay. date. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Ail Fatra was the retreating. It was the, it, it took it took like you know two hundred years, very slow retreating of the glacier, the snow, yeah. which wasn't in Jordan. I mean, the snow was in Turkey, okay, but Jordan was like lush green, okay, for mm -hmm. uh, again for tens of thousands of years during the uh, the, the last glacier. So we had much much more moist, um, rainy European, if you will, like. Um, and the mm -hmm. desert is flat, yeah. it's fantastic. So what happened, obviously, that uh, some plants, when the uh, change of the uh, paleoclimate was, you know, changing and the retreat of the glacier, some plants um, took advantage and made their own single species uh, monoculture, you know, like all, like you would have like 20 meter by 20 meter, all one kind of of uh, wild um, barley, okay, and this is what humans took advantage uh, then, you know, and we're harvesting them and uh, and concentrating enough. So this is like early economy because you know, the minute you do dry uh, shabeka bread, this means that you can put it in in leather and you can trade with another tribe or another tribe at, at a time where you don't have. Uh, you know, you don't have uh, um, uh, spring or you don't have vegetation because you have to remember this is the time of hunters and gatherers. It's it's before agriculture, so this is only hunters and gatherers. But what what made it very strange is that at the time of hunters and gatherers, they were making bread. You know, this what this what stunned everybody. This is the this was the shock. You know, so. Thank you. And by the way, by the way, uh, uh, the issue of architecture, we have examples of architecture um, that is way before, um, it, but it's more like huts with leather and uh, and sticks from a site uh, in Harani. It's called Harani Five and uh, has been excavated and they found uh, like seasonal architecture that is dating to something like twenty-two thousand years. Uh, but that's more tensile. It's not stone. Uh, they have some stones, but it's not like stone walls, like not like an urban in Ghazal. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Tammy, you, ha you have a question? You are with us, Dr. Shami? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mohandis Ammar, thank you for this wonderful lecture. Actually, I want to ask you about, uh, do you remember maybe there is a couple of them in front of the museum, uh, I think the Archaeological Institute at Yarmouk University, the Stonehenge stones, these the stick, big, huge stones, yes. uh, and it used to have like in Arabic, I remember it. With the dolmen um, maybe. Kids. The dolmen. Dolmen. Okay. Dominant, okay. yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful, nice. Uh, there is it used to be hundred of it, and fortunately, it's all of it disappeared. Do you have any inspiration about this uh, in your architectural form? Because until now, I don't know what's the purpose of this uh, uh, shuttles, or I'm not sure what is it. No, I mean, you know, the, yeah, these these are burial, uh, mostly burial, but the, with them comes also the man here or the standing stones. And Jordan, yes, Jordan was actually, uh, maybe still is, but uh, we're losing them very fast. We are maybe the richest, one of the richest countries in the world um, of these um, uh, dolmens, uh, which is basically Bronze Age, uh, 5,000, 6,000 years. And uh, we have, you know, in Jordan Valley, and they are very geologically inspired because in the Jordan Valley pieces, they are made from uh, travertine. And northern uh, around Irbid area, uh, Hebras and uh, Kura, and Kura, they are made from flint, which is another altogether. And then around Ma'in, they're made out of limestone. Uh, uh, so, you know, I love I love uh, single uh, masses of stone, and I found also examples of uh, people in quarries near. Uh, 
near uh, Hallabat who are actually doing some, you know, Egyptian guys and with the is doing their, like their own rooms out of dolmen-like, if you will, but bigger, in fact, because these dolmens are too small. They're really burial. And you have to remember, these dolmens were not as you see them right now. They were covered with a, like a tower of stone. They were they covered, um, sometimes, you know, um, semi-buried or completely buried by a circle of stone. And uh, so what remains is just the big, um, you know, the big um, two vertical or three vertical pieces and then the table or the top, if you will. Uh, I like to use um, stone, uh, you know, uh, I like to use solid material, definitely, but I also have to be careful about handling and the cost and, um, and also structural properties of it. And uh, so, yeah, I don't copy them. Uh, I, you know, learn from them some things and I use them when I feel they can solve a problem, but not, but... But you know, I'm I'm also lucky. I'm an artist, so I can any minute if I want to do something more crazy. Then I do. I'm. I don't think architecture is art. I I don't think architecture should be art. Architecture um, has responsibility, and art should never ever has a responsibility. Art is about architecture is about solving problem, and art is about making problem, not solving, making, challenging, and and making. You know, changing people's perception and pushing people to the edge uh, without harming them. So architecture is, is for me, I don't think, um, you know, this is my big problem with, you know, Zaha Hadid and all this kind of stuff. You know, I don't think architecture should be art. I am an artist. And if I am an artist, I own the material. I don't make art from my client's material. But I am an artist and I do my own art and I, then it's nobody could ask me why is it like this and if I want to do something like you know this megalith or this huge and I can afford it I will do it as a land art as sculpture um, and not architecture. Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Victoria. Sir, you had a question. Uh, actually, it's not a question. It was a question, but now it's no longer a question because it's been partially answered. Uh, I have uh, three comments. One, uh, number one, thank you, Ammar, for uh, staying true, for being true to your title, to the title of the lecture, uh, wh whereby uh, you spend three quarters of your talk uh, talking about uh, the lessons of nature and perhaps less than fourth of you had a talk about your, your artificial work. So I salute you for this. Thank you. Uh, number two, um, just a little comment. Um, um, I don't know if you are familiar with the uh, legacy of uh, Gottfried Samper. No. Okay, Gottfried Samper is... Uh, um, he's now uh, his legacy is being revisited because he was one of the first and was very influential in the 19th century to uh, merge between ethnography and artificial theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, and he had a number of influential uh, books which are now being rediscovered, and becoming very influential once again, whereby uh, um, he anchors artificial with. Uh, Crafts, uh, weaving, not notably weaving, tattooing, and uh, of course carpentry and metallurgy, and uh, um, uh, and earthwork. Uh, the, the the interesting thing about it that you know he was one of the first, and and his his uh, his studies were based on, as I said, uh, ethnography slash archaeology. He was a serious archaeologist, and he was. One, uh, he was very sharp in uh, uh, adapting uh, ethnography to uh, archaeology. Uh, he was a, a precursor in also uh, in gender studies and its role in uh, informing artificial um, uh, the emergence of artificial, where he uh, attributes the origin of artificial to weaving and to women in particular. And um, um, I just want to really, uh, because a lot of what I've said really dovetails with uh, with his own uh, 
uh, findings. So, so I, w- I would really, uh, at w- one point, perhaps I can compare notes with you and share with you uh, some of the fascinating aspects, you know, of, of his uh, work. Um, second thing, uh, last thing is, um, um, now this is a self-serving promotion for our uh, school here at Madaba. Um, of course, really we are, uh, me and my colleagues, um, we are really t- trying to challenge conventional modes of uh, artificial education and trying to find a way to develop uh, embodied modes of uh, learning where our students, you know, will involve, will be in touch with their bodies and with the, with the, with their with their hearts in in learning about uh, artificial. And we do that. We do that, you know, uh, 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 through whether you know through the tools of investigation. We encourage uh, not only. Uh, drawing and sketching, but uh, uh, we encourage using the large-scale physical models as, as a tool of design, not tools of, of presentation, whereby, you know, you attack everything t- t- together, uh, bo- uh, you know, form, structure, program, materiality, and uh, space, and drawings become a representation of the, of the physical, as opposed, you know, drawings, you know, as uh, uh, you know, as a linear uh, graphic uh, exercise that artificial becomes subservient to. So um, in that mode, you know, also we, uh, now this is the point I want to, to put my, uh, to, 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 uh, to extend an invitation about uh, you, uh, about uh, to you. Um, we uh, do um, host, uh, we do uh, seminars and uh, design studios that addresses um, 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 topics that forces the students really to abandon the visual and free them from the formal, whereby, you know, for instance, you know, every semester or every year, we ask them to design structures for the blind. Museum for the blind is is, a, is an example, uh, which um, forces them really to level with the acoustic and the tactile as opposed to the visual as a premise, you know, for, for uh, artificial formation. So accordingly, I extend uh, uh, to you an invitation to uh, uh, do your course, you know, and uh, uh, use us as a platform for launching the, the, this course in the near future. Okay, I'll be uh, honored and this is very exciting. Let's see what we can do about it. Let me comment a few things. Um, definitely the whole connection of crafts, um, which is the added value of raw material and weaving and the putting or nature in order. Uh, and that later had been picked up, of course, you, you know, the art and crafts, Macintosh, and, and then the Japanese are excellent at it because... Yeah, yeah, know, no, I'm talking about artificial theory and artificial education. Uh, this, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Samper is, a, is before arts and crafts. You know, yeah. he, he, he influenced arts, arts and crafts. So it's a beautiful connection to actually yeah. look at yeah. the entire production of uh, anthropology and the items and... But also, the, I, I'd like to also stress your point about women. I, I personally I have a hypothesis that women did not just invent um, um, architecture. I think they invented agriculture. Because if we roughly say hunters and gatherers, yeah. we can say a little bit more that hunters were more men and gatherers were more, were more women. And gatherers meant that they were collecting more seeds uh, of a single species, and, um, and there were extra seeds in front of their cave before ar- ar- architecture. And then they noticed that um, the every season, the same, um, more of the same species is becoming a single, you know, um, culture or single plant. So very likely, the uh, the early agriculture was invented by women before it became politics and um, and legal system and because you know our that i mean the city you know city state has been created uh, as a result of abundance and the uh, agricultural uh, produce um, 
but but also I think women also created um, architecture because they are more sedentary. I mean, men are running around and creating other families and other wadis, and, and women mm. are with the babies. You know, so they are more local. Um, they go. They, they they concentrate locally while men go on the horizon and uh, so architecture is definitely most likely has been mostly influenced by women who um, need to settle um, and not um, keep moving so this is important and in our anthropology we look at uh, at the Bedouin line the numeric line because it's a line that didn't evolve you know it, um, if you go to Yarmouk University there is the um, you know the line of uh, let's say city state and then um, bronze age iron age hellenistic roman byzantine islamic period and then you have the bedouin tent which kept the same you know it's almost yeah. like sharks in the ocean that didn't evolve you know no evolution because their design is so good and in terms of wars or diseases uh, the bedouin option the nomadic line was much safer so it was mm -hmm. kept like plan b if you will. Um, so uh, I think also what is important with students is to actually learn more about their body, uh, more about um, neurology and, and how the human brain um, works uh, with the visual, visual stimuli and the hearing stimuli, plus the touch and smell and uh, you know, how architecture touches and how architecture feels and how it smells and how does it taste, you know. Um, also, issues like elect, you know, f rad free radicals in the human body and our human um, neurology and earthing. This is the word that should be researched by students. Earthing means that getting rid of all the extra charges in the human um, um, neuro system. Um, so walking barefoot, uh, bare feet, and uh, touching, um, and a lot of temples uh, use this. So architecture used the kind of, you know, soothing, earthing. Um, so the whole overlap between, uh, you know, um, psychology and well-being by touching uh, solid architecture that is um, that is uh, conductive electricity. And this is of course hot springs and baths and Roman baths and all that kind of stuff. Plus also temples and um, and skin uh, contact. Uh, there are a lot of um, um, cases. There are some resources, um, you know, text text mentioning healing people by um, putting their spinal cord on uh, a column somewhere in Aleppo or somewhere. I, you know, there's some bits and pieces of um, of healing by by architecture, uh, physically, literally, and most of it is probably connected to um, free radicals, um, earthing, removing free radicals from the human body because you know the earth is a big battery and uh, and all the our nervous system uh, psychology is all electricity uh, so there is a connection there that students could and th this is a you know that we have a very very weak connection between um, medicine and uh, and architecture and this is a, a very sad and depressing thing that even even in you know Columbia Harvard I don't know the biggest universities they don't even talk about it I've been um, Getting a bit of excitement from Venice University, you have um, to actually push in, um, in a course that is um, working on overlap between uh, neuro neurology and architecture. Mm -hmm. So, because neurology is, you know, is everything is visual process. It's it's um, it's hearing and seeing and understanding and volume and space and constructing. I mean, all what we see in architecture is is constructed in our brain. You know, and uh, what happens between the eye. The architecture, if you look at a dome, between the dome and your eye is one story. Then between your eye to your retina is another story. Then between your retina to the nervous system, the cables that bring it to your brain and, and rebuild that dome in that in your brain is another story. And if architects, you know, some, not all of them, but some architects should actually go in that uh, area and uh, explore. Um, otherwise, we just, you know, we're copying styles and... Uh, Pinterest, uh, you know, kind of uh, collage. Thank you. Uh, we will entertain one last question from Samira Isa. Samira? Okay. Yeah. Hello. 
ஹலோ ஹலோ அலன் அலன் I am um, a graduate from the American University but now I'm doing my master degree in London. My question is um, to Dr. Ammar is um, I visited one of your buildings that you presented on the presentation and it actually has a special soul in the building a special experience in the building. Um I would like to know if you can summarize a three or four elements that you are using in your design methodology while designing such a great inspirational building that have a soul in it. Thank you. Thank you. I I think there's always a soul in a site. And sometimes um in fact 90% of the cases the the site has a better soul before the architects um comes and uh, ruins the site i think uh an empty site is nicer than making an architecture um intervention on it i actually honestly think that architecture is a sin you know i prefer really yeah i mean almost it's like also you know eating hamburger is a sin or killing a, a nice goat is a sin or killing a fish is a sin but we have to eat i mean this is a bit of a problem because architecture is a sin we have to be very 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 careful that we really make less of that sin and very careful to to not go there showing our muscles and outsmarting the site and out lo- being louder and being ego and saying i want to keep leave my mark you know So for me the site is the architect not me I'm a draftsman I I just sit there listen what the site and the client you know the program and and the employment potential of the my intervention and you know other stuff of, of the program but but the site is the architect and if the site has a soul I'm there as a guardian to protect the soul to first of all to identify the soul to pick it up and 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 acknowledge that the site has a soul and every site the most ugly site in in on on earth has a soul you know if you go to i don't know to a middle of a refugee camp in the middle of wadi al haddadi you know um so the site is uh, and the site is a big word i mean the site is not just the property the site is the is the solar system is our you know our galaxy our solar system the earth and then east mediterranean and then the western height and amman al balqa amman and then uh, you know uh, a certain neighborhood in amman and then a certain piece of land and the site also includes the intangible parts like the knowledge of people the technology the culture their music their food this is all site their language um, the poetry the art their weaving this is also part of the site so the site is 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 everything and it's actually i i'm very very careful to be invisible i don't want to be i don't want to exist actually as an architect you know i'd rather help the site do the job and without me um you know f- making fake statements visual statements or or so that they look nice in a magazine or something like that you know i'm very very careful so i and i'm slowly actually moving away from architecture you know because i uh, i'm so critical of myself and um, of this guilt of going to a, a site and adding something to it and uh, in a way um uh, i think maybe i'll end up doing more writing and maybe more music research in music theory and uh, some botany and stuff um but again you know, i don't think that architecture is about eating chocolate you know it's not a positive yeah. thing it's very very difficult to do it right um and then you go to dubai and the gulf and it's 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 really i don't know it's disgusting but uh, life goes on and uh, maybe i'm wrong um uh, and i think for students who want to make a lot of money they should not listen to me you know at all Osama Tawal uh, uh, architect Osama Tawal have a question about the baptism site about the salata of uh, uh, churches i wrote about it with muhammad baib and i believe that they will destroy uh, the baptism site but it is 
يعني good to hear your opinion uh, عمار what is going in the uh, archaeological and eco eco religious site of the baptism site yes the site I was aware of it uh, <clears throat> at the time where uh, I was very good friend with uh, Michele Picciarello uh, who was the best Picciarello, expert yeah. Yeah, before he died mm -hmm. and we helped him in a couple of things and we had a lot of uh, work <clears throat> we're working with the same sites together um, in the 90s. And then uh, the baptism site became like, you know, a new discovery or a big thing. And uh, um, and I think it I think it was not uh, carefully master planned. I think some mm -hmm. of the early uh, buildings are too monumental and they're too bulky. And in fact, they failed. You know, I was there like, I don't, yeah. there, I don't go there often, but I was there about... Uh, half a year ago or a year ago and they're all abandoned you know these big things that look like like, like a mall or something you know almost like a shopping center that is all abandoned and broken it doesn't make sense you know i would have liked to see nothing because the the um, byzantine archaeology is very shy and fragile and i would have uh, really you know, the more you add, the less of the authentic percentage becomes. I mean, before it was 100% authentic. Authenticity now is like 90% uh, rubbish and 10% authenticity. So maybe I, 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 like, I like giving land to different um, churches and other religions, by the way. But uh, all the different Christian sects, maybe different, every sect could get a, a land. That's a good idea. But they, that those should have been a little bit more removed uh, from the archaeological side. They're too close to uh, my um, taste. I would have liked to see them like, I don't know, five kilometers away. And the area should be um, dealt with as an ecosystem. I would probably get people yeah. like RCN to take care of the bird migration and the species of uh, vegetation cover and the biodiversity, uh, not just the archaeology. For sure, as an eco religious site, absolutely. Yes, thank you. The last two questions from two students, yeah. and then uh, I promise we will close because it's already your company. Okay, Christine, Christine Dawood. Hello, okay, Samine. Yeah, um, thank you for the lecture, Ammar, and I would like to thank Dr. Yasser Saqar, um, his student from five years ago. <laughs> um, now, my question is, uh, since we, we were talking about archaeology and architecture and all that, I think uh, bringing up museums is relevant a bit, since it represents, like, it presents archaeology in a way, but... Um, from my point of view, it, it's missing the process and it's missing like the full story. It's just putting like the image uh, in front of people and just like put it there. And it's, I always felt irrelevant. Like I get excited before going to a museum, but the, always the, the experience it, it itself is more like a, it's, it's very Google, you know, you have the information, but you don't get any kind of uh, experience. So uh, I, I think uh, maybe there should be another approach in thinking how to do museums or how to present this inf this archaeological information. So I would like to hear your uh, view on this. Yes, I mean, you know, museums are uh, are becoming out of fashion. I don't like the word anymore. And it, it's fine for a big city like you know, London, New York. I mean, those are a huge city that actually you know, took everything from everywhere. And this is from 18th century encyclopedic, you know, at the times of uh, um, Darwin and collecting everything. And fine, you know, Victorian Albert, and this is important for big cities to have them. And But, I mean, again, Victorian Albert Museum is a research center. I mean, you go there. I would go to Victorian Albert and open a drawer and find and find in it a, a, a piece of cloth from Beit Sahur and see how the embroidery is, as as a textile designer in London. So they are important in big cities, definitely, but not 
not in Jordan. I mean, in Jordan, I was actually against the big museum in uh, the way they've done the Amman uh, Museum, uh, the National Jordan Museum. I would have liked to see 40 smaller uh, visitor centers, I would call them, or not even this, I would call them, uh, they're called um, interpretation centers, in sites, on the site or next to the site. And the, the, the um, role of interpretation center in Wadi Finan or in um, you know Tal uh, uh, Abul Kharaz or small even smaller sites and those museums should be specialized. So like one area where you have bronze smelting, you make a museum about metallurgy. One area where you have Pella, you put about like ancient wars and Egypt and you know whatever it was important in Pella. Pella is Pella is everything and it's a more difficult site. But I, again, those interpretation centers should actually give you a, vid, a, 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 a viewing glasses, you know, they should, they should teach you, they should make you lit, more literate. So when you, and you should go first to them before you go to the site, because they will make you see better. So like in Petra, I don't like that museum at all, but I would have made not something like that. I would have made something underground and I, I would have actually showed the tool marks and so that you are educated when you go to the site, you understand which tools made which texture. And, and, and of course, now we can do a lot of this stuff with, with like augmented reality, where you download a Petra app and uh, I use your smartphone and show you um, animation um, and maybe do some apps that scan some of the chisel marks in Petra and show you the tools and even make you hear the sound of these tools because we know the tools, they're in the drawer, they're not beautiful. This is why they don't display them. They like to put the sculptures and the statues, you know. We're still, we're making museums in something what we call antiquarian. You know, antiquarian in London, when they, London, like 1850, uh, they, they, they had these weird museums of just bringing weird stuff and putting them together. And that, but that was the beginning, ugly, uh, limited um, um, start of archaeology was antiquary, antiquary, something antiquities, just bring me antiquities. We're now in Jordan still work on this level, you know, we're not really doing interpretive um, um, centers that, that give you um, better um, eyeglasses that you can go to the site and um, and and really um, make it relevant to you as an interactive, understand it, you know, uh, as relevant to you. Thank you. And uh, lastly, Farah from Saudi. Marhaba, um, Mr. Hamar Khamash. Um, regarding what you said about, um, you know, your being and not wanting to do architecture anymore because it's ruining the site or the site has a soul and the the architect is imposing their selves the architects are imposing their selves on the site Hala, basically in, in amman i'm asking on the habit i'm just gonna say it in arabic i'm sorry um hala, إذا نحن بعمان عم نحكي إنه ال ال we don't want to do architecture we want to leave empty sites how should we habitat يعني should we habitat horizontally and go outside of عمان borders and habitat the إنه الصحراء والأماكن ال that are far and مش مسكونة or should we just do it vertically and end up being sorry يعني as ugly as Dubai or something because I think يعني عمان is the numbers of population are exceeding and rapidly are we supposed to think horizontally or vertically in order to يعني, indulge in this process together as architects or as students يعني, to think when is we want to preserve the sites in Amman how should we habitate the people or how, how should we explore our ideas and thank you so much for everything. Thank you. First, first of all I think we should make we should really um, um, implement uh, birth control first of all I, I, don't, I think I think we're too many of us uh, not just in Jordan I mean globally um, and it's not fun uh, and it's not healthy and it's not good first secondly 
um, I think Amman, if you look at from Google, uh, even Abdun, for example, um, has 30%, maybe up to 40% actually, of Abdun is empty. I'll give you another example. Jabal Webde. I think 20% of Jabal Webde, I'm not saying vertical or horizontal, I'm saying empty plots. You know, Jabal Webde has, look at Google, look at from Sky. Jabal Webde has 20, maybe 25% empty. In the last few years, some um, you know Iraqis were buying some land and doing some ugly buildings. That's another story. But what I'm saying is that in the middle of Amman, you have areas. There are actually areas that are up to seventy percent or eighty percent empty. Look around, for example, the central bank building between the central bank building and and Abdali. Abdali, uh, not the modern Abdali, I mean Abdali um, bus stop, okay? Yani, Makhbaz Salah al Din. That area, not, not the skin, not the veneer that have few shops on the main road, you know, with medical supplies and lab supplies, behind it is actually up to 80% abandoned, okay? So, what we need to do, what need, we need to do is and it's happening a little bit, by the way, uh, by not by our smart uh, planning or anything. What we need to do is to actually design proper vitamins to to bring people um, to work and live in a lot of these places. Whether adding one floor, I am for densification, hundred uh, percent, but not high rise. You know, a man doesn't take high rise. Just densification mean one more floor or fix the old um, fabric and make it take more people per square meter with more livable space and nicer gardens and courtyards and I think Amman can actually take uh, probably 50% more without um, invading without Amman Jadida Taban this is another <laughs> it's a joke well uh, neither neither um, neither invading further but this is all politics you know I, I mean who am I to tell uh, you know people um, who have a lot of land around you know east of amman and suddenly you you tell them you know no more urban sprawl and they will the parliament will not pass it nobody dares to actually talk about it so it's all it's all land it's all about land um so um no i think i think um yeah amman has a lot of empty plots it can take much more but also you think about soft um, about apps, what is changing um, downtown and bringing it new life are a couple of apps. One of them is called Uber and Kareem, the other one. Those are bringing life to downtown because I now can go downtown without fighting with the taxi driver and without going there with my car and not find a place. So I can go downtown and really go to a place or a cafe and come back because of these apps. The other app that can work um, to actually, as a as a, a master planner, is uh, Airbnb, because and connected and in connection to Google uh, Map, <clears throat> because you can actually renovate any little room in Jabal Ashrafiyya, uh, make it hip and nice and cool, and put it on Airbnb, and you'll get you know um, economy running, and and I think also downtown. Um, needs um, good public transportation besides uh, maybe some trams and maybe some uh, some telefreak actually um, that connects um, sale with the Ashrafi one or two lines above because those are easy to construct and they're not for tourists you know I'm saying for for Imam Muhammad from Ashrafi to go down uh, downtown to buy something and go up again like the service you know on top of the urban um, uh, fabric, if you will, but again, downtown is is a big mess, and it can take uh, and not just the downtown. The I'm saying the edges of the bowl, the edges of the container, you know, the edges of the not the downtown, it, the flat part, but between you know the dead tissue, dead tissue between Shara al Salt and Jabal Hussein, for example. That's that's about eighty percent um, um, abandoned and run down, you know. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh...
عند سمار خماش دكتور نايف بتحب تحكي شيء دكتور ياسر يعني مبسوط انه هاي اول تعاون بيناتنا يعني uh, the first collaboration between the faculty of architecture at the American University and you and I would like to promise us that we will continue this collaboration um, immediately after Corona. <laughs> I'm ready anytime. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ammar. يعني we oh, learn. Oh, uh, naif, uh, as far as cooperation is concerned, uh -huh. I, mean, I, I was I started talking with Ammar about uh, yeah. comparing notes about our experience in Zion Studio. Yeah. Uh, for for that of reuse of uh, yeah, yeah. Mamdouf Shar building. So uh, he. I think I, mean, I don't want to speak on his behalf, but he, he he's really excited about what we are doing, and inshallah he will join us as a, at least as a crit in, mm -hmm. uh, in our in our jury. For sure, it is our يعني, pleasure to have you, not only uh, with uh, adaptive reuse, but with a lot of uh, let us say lectures that I believe you can يعني, help. To us in uh, the campus after, and and plus and plus that course, you know, on sure, embodi sure. On, on, on embodiment. Sure, okay. but I mean, I would like to return to the simpler and the surface design. With Dr. Yasser, we make a research about the connection of the Hellenistic architecture and chamber. Dr. Yasser, you can talk about this experience. Uh, no, I, I need to, to you know, since uh, you are the one who pulled me in the direction of uh, Macedonian tombs, you know, and uh, seeing okay. the application. You, 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 nice, Yanni, to see the surface, the origin of the surface, and the half concept of Vitruvius. Uh, this is uh, يعني, what we would like to discuss with you. Because uh, it, it, it was it was a cr critique of uh, you know the uh, Vitruvian model which dominated uh, until uh, until re recently all studies you know about you know uh, uh, the architecture of antiquity and and uh, and uh, uh, until the re Renaissance. So um, يعني, I, I think the best way really to continue discussion about him is to share with him our published research on this. Yes, yes, yes. And okay. maybe maybe we'll have a, a dedicated discussion on this topic. Yeah, okay. and it will be our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Ammar, again. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, thank thanks. You. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, Ammar. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Thank you, Ammar. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. تو كلودين بعد 27 في ناس عم بيطلعوا في ناس عم بيدخلوا انا برايي خلص سكري يس يس اوكي الخميس ستة ونص خميس بكره في كمان بكره في محاضرة بكرة <تصفيق> يلا باي باي وسام اللي عم بيسألوا عن السلايدز رح نشوف مع الدكتور بالآخر بس البرزنتيشن على اليوتيوب يعطيكم العافية وشكرا أوكي باي 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 وسام باي 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 يعطيك العافية يلا باي يلا خلص أنا نسكر يلا باي هاي أنا سكرت